open one. I have my um, uh, uh, air conditioning on because this is just going to be like a chill pre-tape part. Nando's coming soon. But yeah, the AC is on. So someone should remind me um, to shut off the AC in a bit so that the sound is better. Um, yeah, what else? Um, we got a great show today. And yeah, that video, that image I took, I hate, I hate finding copyright free images. And that's like from 1982, I just discovered. So I'll change it. Uh, someone find me a uh, copyright free image. Maybe I'll just put on Jim Zogby and Anya. Um, oh yeah, so exciting announcement, guys. Ready? We have another guest added to the lineup. Nando's running late. So maybe we'll have to cancel him. Um, and uh, Anya Parampil is also coming on. So we got Jim Zogby and Anya Parampil. And look at this, ready? Look at this cool stuff. Jim Zogby has a new article, and I think it's just it was just for the just for this in, in particular. He wrote it. He really felt like he needed to. Just kidding, not true at all. He's a prolific writer. So let me actually just give you this link. Okay. Um. All right. But here you guys can read it in the meantime. If you would like, let's see. It's about Jesse Jackson. Yeah, so this is like the pre pre tape. Let's just call this we're we're okay. Yeah, someone find me a good image. I will use it. This is I don't like this lipstick either. All right. This lip gloss, this whatever. Okay. There's the article. Why is YouTube having some mental problems? Much better. Right? All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the, the nice words. You know what? I'm going to take advantage while now I'm still running late. I'm going to... No. I'm going to take advantage of this. I'll do a little periscope. Okay, let's see. Live, live, live. Invite guests. I got to look into this. I'm not sure how this works. Oops. I'm so bad at technology. I just had the camera the wrong way. I did a bunch of stuff that was messed up today. What else did I do? Wrong link. No. Hold on. Okay. All right. I'm going on to Periscope. And telling people about this, about the movement. Hi, everyone. It's Katie Halper. I am about to do a great live stream interview with, I look so red in this screen. Terrible. With Jim Zogby of the Arab American Institute. Also with, we just added to the lineup, the wonderful Anya Parampil. We're going to be talking about Beirut. We're going to be talking about Jim's latest article at The Nation. We're going to be talking about... Um, Lebanon, the Middle East, Palestine, and Rashida Tlaib. Um, and uh, it's going to be great. So go over to my pinned tweet and you will find what I'm talking about. Um, and it will be a wonderful time. Also, Nando Villa will be there and we'll be talking about um, Chris Murphy. Not Chris Matthews, Chris Murphy. Um, I think that's about it. So yeah, go on over to YouTube. I look so much more washed out on this YouTube thing. I don't like this red face thing. It's much better over here. All right. Bye, everyone. What is this thing when they ask to join? Can't anyone join? Okay. All right. Anyone have any questions for me? Consider this an AMA. I love this program. Whatchamacallit? Um, StreamYard, but I don't like that it's, well, there are a couple things I don't like about it. One is that they should automatically not have the audio on. Second of all, it's, um, I know I look better on Twitter somehow. I know. I don't know what's happening. It's very upsetting. Zoom, really? I mean, I know I should be talking about more important stuff, but also what's weird is that there is a delay Oh, tell Jimmy to send his people over here. In fact, let me do that now. There's a delay on YouTube, but the comments are faster. One second, guys. 
Let me ask Nando. In the meantime, ask me what questions you would like me to answer. What the hell is going on? I'm waiting. All right, guys, my co-host is late. So I don't have anything planned right now. And I thought I would just wait. Uh, so much tech talk. All right. Okay, so does anyone have any questions? This is like an ask me anything that I haven't planned. So, oh, it looks terrible though. It's so, uh, uh, whoa, look at that terrible. I didn't, is this what it usually looks like on YouTube? YouTube is cutting service to select a show. You're unable to watch it. What? That's not good. Yeah, I am doing this on StreamYard, but maybe I should do it directly on here. All right, I don't. I don't understand. No one has any questions. Yeah, yeah, you made it. My connection's lagging. Hold on. Let me try to let me try to reconnect. I you know what's ridiculous? I have is I have this thing actually plugged in. Hold on. Let me hold on, guys. It's gonna go dark for a second just because I don't wanna hold on. Do you guys see me? I want to stop cam. Hold on. I hate it. Okay, which is, all right, is this better? Oh, our first guest is here. Is this better? Okay, well, I think I'm just going to start because I don't know where my co-host is and I and my guest is ready, so, which is very exciting. Okay, are you guys ready? Is the connection okay? Um... One second, let me just make sure this is working. Um, my camera is showing up, right? All right, let me just see something. Okay. All right, let me just shut off the AC and then I will start. Already. Okay. So everyone, um, thank you again so much for coming. Um, and really excited to bring on our first guest. Um, and he is a uh, a pollster, um, a professor, and the head of the Arab American Institute. Jim Zogby. Hello. Hi, Katie. How are you? I'm fine. Well, uh, welcome to uh, the live stream. We've I've had you on the show before, but just audio. So, uh, oh, sorry about this. There's a bunch of different tech things happening. 
So <laughs> thank you for your patience. Um, and thank God you're such a mensch. Um, so there's a lot to talk about. Um, first off, condolences. Um, well, for uh, two things. I don't know if you want me to mention the... Well, you've tweeted about it. So your anniversary. So condolences again for your wife, who seemed amazing. Um, she was amazing. Yeah. She was. She still is. Yeah. I mean, she lives on in, in, in me and in my kids and, and influences still in so many ways. And uh, was she, I know that she was, I didn't realize until I, I, you posted this, I guess she was Irish background, Irish American or. She was Irish and she developed such an incredible passion about Ireland in particular um, when she became so aware of the famine history, uh, which is something we never study here, you know, and when, when it, it's when her, her family came over um, and when you don't know a story and you learn the story and the magnitude of it is so enormous. I mean, a third of the country died of starvation. A third was forced into exile. And, um, and all the while Ireland, Ireland is exporting food to England because the British colonized it and controlled all the foodstuffs. And so the Irish were left basically with potatoes to eat when the famine hit. That's when they died. Right. And there's a whole debate, right, over how intentional it was. It was not intentional, but what was intentional was when it was going on, the British could have changed policy and made food available, but they didn't. Okay. Uh, there were some lame uh, efforts at uh, charity work, but in some cases, charity work went with conversion, um, the Protestantism. So uh, it was, in fact, genocide. There was no question about oh, it. Oh, so it was genocide. It's just a question of whether it was uh, like premeditated. Yeah. Got it. Um, I'm looking for if there are any, uh, you have a photo of her. I'm looking for, if you had um, some old photos, I believe. Maybe not. Um, oh, here it is. C can I show a photo? Sure. Okay. This is cool. This is a, and can you tell people about what she did in life? Uh, she raised five kids. I mean, she was a school teacher, but then when the kids started coming, <laughs> It was a full-time job, and she worked in a bookstore for a couple of years and managed the children's section. There's a funny story about the children's section. We were living in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and um, the uh, that's that's her on one side when we first met uh, early on, and then on the other side is her uh, just a couple of years ago. Um, and the uh, same face. Yeah, she was she was managing this bookstore, the children's section of the bookstore. And she set it up. It was just quite, it, you know, it's something you see in bookstores all the time now. But back in 1973, it was a novelty. And so we were real excited about it. And people would come on Saturdays and there'd be reading uh, reading days during the summer when kids would come in. And one day I was in the bookstore uh, uh, alone on a, on a Saturday afternoon. And some seedy looking guy leans in the door and he says to me, uh, uh, you got an adult section? And I, being totally oblivious to what was going on, just said, uh, well, we've got a children's section in the back, but everything else is for grownups. And he says, wise ass, and slams the door and leaves. And wow. We laughed about that forever. Uh, oh, did he not come back, I'm assuming? No, no because uh, yeah. by then I figured out what he wanted. And no, we did have an adult section. We did not. Yeah. Have, no. Um, and... What, uh, how did she find out about the Irish history? Well, we, we, it wasn't taught. she traveled with me to the Middle East, uh, in the beginning quite a bit. Um, and one time I got invited to an Oxford debate, um, uh, forget what we were debating. Um, and I said, would you come? And she said, yes, but will you take me to Ireland? It was 1989. And, uh, uh, we went and we spent about four days in Ireland. That was all, but fell in love with the place we'd been back. I think we made 12 trips together. We had our 50th wedding anniversary in, in Ireland and brought all the kids with us and took them on a tour of the whole country. It was just incredible. I have five kids, 13 grandkids. So it was uh, the Irish economy boomed for a couple a couple weeks while we were there. Yeah. Um, and she, uh, in her name, I set up an, uh, an Eileen Patricia McMahon Irish education uh, endowment at the college where we met as freshmen. Um, because they have an Irish studies program. And so we're going to do a oh, lecture yeah. every year on famine or on um, 
Irish aspects of Irish history that aren't taught here and also on Irish immigration to America. Because the wow. Irish are interesting. Uh, one of the things I discovered was that um, uh, I, I chair the Ethnic Council in the Democratic Party, you know, and so we have all the ethnic groups and I got to know many of them. I go to their events and the like. But the Irish have been unique in that it's the only culture that I know of that has a literature and, um, and a, a body of music and poetry focused on immigration. You know, I mean, every group has its unique characteristics that they that they've you know, memorialized in literature. Right. For the Irish, it was their immigration. It was the loss of uh, mothers losing their sons, lovers losing their 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 partners. Um, you've gone. You're, you're not coming back. I know you won't be back and I'm lost without you. The Irish even have what until recently they did this when someone left to go to America, they would have a wake. Um, because they knew that they were never going to see them again. Um, wow. It's an entire aspect of the culture that's really quite unique. And when you hear Mary Black sing Ellis Island, um, there isn't anyone who comes from an immigrant background that doesn't tear up because the, the sense of I'm seeing you off in the port, I know you're not coming back, what am I going to do without you? It's just really quite quite poignant. And the Irish, it's very much a part of who they are. Huh. Wow. Um, did you, do you feel like any of it was, um, was it her being in the Middle East at all and like colonial history that made her interested in it or? Oh, I, the, the woman had a passion for justice. I, I actually tell the story. Uh, this is not what we started talking about, but I love talking about her. So I'll continue. Um, I was studying my, for my master's comprehensives um, and I was, it was PhD in religion. And so I was doing Buddhism and Hinduism and early Christian history and Islam, and I'm going through the studying, and she's reading. And she would read, and when she'd find something that would anger her, she'd read it aloud. She'd have to hear this. And so she was reading, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. Um, and, and she was, like, furious about it. Um, and they broke treaties. They dispossessed them. They kicked them off their land, et cetera. And, um, uh, and after she finished that, she picked up a book by John Davies called An Evasive Peace. It was, uh, he was the first head of UNRWA, that's the UN agency right. that deals with Palestinian refugees. And she started reading it, and the same thing started all over again. Uh, they broke treaties. They dispossessed them. They, 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 they betrayed them. Um, and her zinger line was, and these are your people, and you don't know anything. You're not doing anything about it. I was very involved in anti-war and civil rights stuff. But I wasn't doing anything about this. And so I read John Davies' Evasive Peace. And then I read another one and another one. And a year later, we were on our way to Beirut to do my dissertation work, which turned out to be in the Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon. So, uh, and Jordan, we went to both. And um, so when she became aware of the same history in Ireland, she became quite passionate about it. And we were. I think it was on our third trip there, we were at Trinity College and there was an exhibit of documents from the early Irish revolution. And one of them from the Irish revolutionary movement was a salute to all the people in the world fighting against British colonial rule, in particular, the Arabs of Palestine. And I, uh, that, she was so struck by that, you know, and uh, we, I, we both were, it was really quite, uh, it was really quite nice to see. Oh, well, and it would have been your, it was your, what year anniversary? Uh, the, the one we all went as a family was our 50th. It was two years ago. Okay. Wow. Um, well, thank you for sharing that. Thank um, you so I'm excited. When, do you know what the first, um, uh, it's going to be a, a lecture, you said? It'll be a lecture with the question is will the colleges be open in the in the in the spring oh right so you'll have to do if not a zoom right yeah, well they won't do it we won't do it if, if done we'll wait until we actually can do it in person oh okay um so you um have a uh do you have headphones sorry i forgot to ask you about that are you wearing headphones no i'm not okay do you have any uh yeah i think it'll be better because i i forgot to tell you that but it'll have less feedback You may have to reselect the thing. And also, in the meantime, I will just remind people that they can find this very uh, 
Jim is very prolific writer. So um, he now has a piece uh, from today. The Democratic Party let down, mm -hmm. um, which I put the link in to. Um, and I will I'll I'll show it on the screen uh, in a bit. But I want to just have yes. I'm talking face to face. Um, and um, just for context, um, so Jim, again, or James Zogby, is the founder and president of the Arab American Institute and also was a member of the executive committee of the DNC from 2001 to 2017 um, and was part of the effort to make the platform more progressive. Um, and there's great footage of him along with people like um, Cornell West and Nina Turner and Ben Jealous making the case for uh, justice, basically. And um, not, we'll just say that not everyone was um, uh, down with the cause, I would say. Um, so what That's made true. you, sure, right? Um, let me, I'm just going to, I'm going to like, uh, can you rejoin and select the headphones? I just want to make sure that you have the right, the correct thing selected. Um, or, it's just in my is phone. Is it okay? Okay. It's yeah. okay. Yeah, you're right. It's fine then. Um, uh, okay. So tell us about this piece and what made you want to write it? Well, look, I, I, I've been going to conventions for decades. Um, and I remember when conventions actually used to be exciting and suspenseful and you debated things and people who went as delegates actually played a role. Um, and I've noted over the years, the degree to which uh, delegates have become props, uh, props to be managed, you know, hold your sign up, clap at this point, you know, whatever. And they're musical interludes. It's like going to a game show and uh, you know, you're, you, you respond on cue. Um, and, uh, that works if you're all on the same page, but if you've got a body of delegates who are from the opposing side and you want to unify them, then there has to be a place for them to feel that they've had a chance to be heard. People all over the country run for delegate. Uh, people spend money. They do work. It's not, you don't just get appointed. In some cases, you have to fill up, you have to get petitions signed, you have to go door to door. You campaign for yourself and for the candidate. <clears throat> and so people come to the convention, no role to play, and they go home feeling like, what did I even do this for? Um, and this, in 2016, we saw, you know, there was not just that, but there was also a sense of a letdown because there were a lot of first timers there who didn't know the drill that, you know, it's over. Uh, they thought we're going and we're going to have a chance to be heard. I worked hard to get here, spent money to get here and they go home with nothing. This convention is uh, sort of, it's the, I call it the, the reductio ad absurdum of conventions. It's a convention reduced to the absurd. It's like, it's totally managed. It's going to be a two hour infomercial every night with speeches and music and video clips and stuff with no input at all. You're going to, you're only, you might as well watch it on C-SPAN basically. Um, did, yeah. the, the voting has been already done. We've gotten our ballots and we've turned them in. Um, and you got a lot of people who are going to feel let down. And I've been saying to the party now for three months, um, you got to do something. You got to say to people, especially first timers, um, uh, we want to hear from you. We want input from you. I know you worked hard and you ran. Uh, it can't be just this ballot is the only thing that I got for it, right? And so I, I think that they've got a week and a half left to figure out how do we engage folks? How do we engage in particular the thousand Bernie folks who are going to not feel all excited when it's over, but are going to feel let down and it may be alienated and maybe even upset. I mean, there's already a petition of 700 plus Bernie delegates who are saying, we're not going to vote for the platform because Medicare for all is not in there. Nobody's talking to them. And if you don't talk to them, uh, you lose them. And my concern is I remember Jesse Jackson in 1988 speaking at the convention said famously, uh, it takes two wings to fly. Uh, you need both the progressive wing and the moderate wing to unify to win. Um, and if that doesn't happen, we're going to lose uh, a, a significant number of progressives. Does that mean Biden loses? No. I think he's got a very strong base of support uh, in several communities. And I think, of course, a lot of progressives are going to support him, too.
But I, I, if you lose five, six hundred people uh, who are delegates, who all have a base in their communities, those are people you don't need to lose. And so it's an appeal to the party to take advantage of at least the next week and a half to figure out how do we reach out to these folks? How do we create some opportunity during the four days for them to be heard, for them to feel like they had a role to play uh, and they just simply weren't? Uh, people sitting home turning on a dial and turning off a dial because they earned that right to be right. heard. They, they worked hard to get there. And so um, I'm trying to a avoid a problem. And this is one way to do it is to just go to the press and say, this is a problem. Let's talk about it. Yeah. It also seems really irresponsible um, because uh, if Trump is this existential threat and unprecedented, then why wouldn't you try to do everything you could to engage people, get out to vote and have people give some people something to vote for? I mean, I also think it's just absolutely morally um, reprehensible to not, for instance, have Medicare for all as part of an aspirational platform. I mean, I don't get the, the calculation there, even on a political level. What is it that they're afraid of? They just don't want to morally sanction something that's incredibly popular because then they're afraid they're going to have to offer it or fight for it. You know, the the platforms, I've also been involved in platform fights going back to 88 when I was uh, one of Jackson's people on the platform group drafting, helping to work out the platform. And, uh, um, and I've learned that platforms are not policy statements. They're political test of wills uh, between competing factions. And what, from the progressive side, what, 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 what we bring into it is a clear perspective and a, and a set of values. Uh, I'm not sure that the establishment sees it that way. They're looking at, you know, big pharma, what are they going to say? And health industry, uh, insurance companies, what are they going to say? And uh, the you know in the Israel thing, what's the what's the pro-Israel crowd going to say, and what's what's Planned Parenthood going? They've got all of these groups that are influential with money or with political power that they're weighing, and so it's a it's a political weight thing uh, that ends up with a platform that is not really a policy document at all. Actually, the last time anybody ever looks at the platform is when it gets passed. Um, if I, if I ask people, do you remember the 2016 platform? No. Are, are you going to even see the 2020 platform? I doubt it. Uh, I remember I was on the, I chaired the, the resolutions committee of the, of the DNC for a number of years. Um, and <laughs> one of the, I remember one of the funny things was, uh, uh, in 2017, my last time, uh, uh, as, as chair of it, um, somebody, a member introduced a resolution that we should hold Democratic members of Congress um, responsible or accountable for uh, supporting legislation that was in support of the platform, right? And he had come up with a whole bunch of bills in Congress that were uh, reflected of, in the values of the platform. Uh, and they, they went hysterical. We can't pass that, that's not our job. And he said, but it's in the platform. And you know what, what he was operating on the basis that this is a policy statement that matters, and they were of the position, no, it's not. It's over. Forget it. Uh, we're not gonna. We're not going there. And so it never even came up for a vote. Um, they they just quashed it. And it kind of kind of um, interesting that we expend so much time on it because it is a test of wills, but it's not um, it's not policy. And so, frankly, what. What Joe Biden will do on health care is still to be determined. Um, right. And, and uh, but nevertheless, I support the um, the Bernie delegates network position that we should vote against it because it's not in there as a statement. As right. if it's a test of wills, we got will, and our will is right. we can't support it because it's not in there. Yeah, I mean, it almost makes it that much more important. I mean, I know it's symbolic, but if this is all symbolism anyway, then why not just fight for it? Here's the symbolism. Yeah, symbolism from our side is we say no. And so, what line. happens if you say no? Nothing. Nothing. It's just that they. I they mean, blow you know, it off. It's going to pass. It'll they pass. got the votes to pass it. Yeah. 
So what um, could anything and, and here's be? The thing. No. Here's the thing. They got the votes to pass it. And I dare say of the, the, the 3,800 votes they're going to get to pass it, uh, maybe 10 of those people actually will read the platform. Okay. I swear to you, it will not be read. Maybe we can do something about it. Pressure people, you know, because there should be a pen. They, they should feel pressure to put it into the platform. And, you know, Trump would love it if if there was a big like, I mean, this is going to be really if Trump is smart, which he's not, but he's he's good at this stuff. It's probably too nerdy for him. But I was going to say he could just say, look at how pathetic these guys are. They can't even get their delegates to vote for him or something. Um, no, I, 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 I yeah, I. You're right. It might be interesting. I doubt that they'll uh, make an issue of it. I doubt they'll make an issue of right. it. I'm just saying it'll be they don't, they don't want to go no. there either. Yeah. I don't know. My He's, thing my my thing about Trump is that he always has a leg up because he doesn't have to be ideological. He doesn't have to be consistent. He doesn't have to be principled. He doesn't have to be not hypocritical. He just, it's like asymmetrical warfare with him. I'm sorry, Katie. When you said he got a leg up, I, I oh, had yeah. an Im image of a dog at a fire hydrant. Oh yeah, well, which he, he does, also, yeah. which he also does, right? Does yeah, he does. Yeah, he <laughs> resembles that too. Although I'm a big dog person, so that's probably not fair. <laughs> okay. Um, God, um, comparing yeah, that, that's interesting. It's unfair yeah. to dogs, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's it's canophobia. <laughs> um, and what about uh, what about uh the situation in shifting gears a little, although your role on the platform was one of the things that you were very um, vocal about was uh, calling the Palestinian occupation an occupation, which as someone pointed out in 2016, um, that Hillary Clinton herself had called it an occupation in her books. And Joe Biden had called it an occupation. And Joe and, Biden. Or Barack Obama had called it an occupation. Right. And as the speaker at the platforms that Ariel Sharon called it an occupation. I mean, right. I do not, test of wills, I do not know where it comes from, who, it's baffling to me, who in their right mind pressures the platform to draw a red line on the word occupation. Right. I don't, I don't get it at all. Um, it makes no sense. That makes no sense to me at all. I mean, I get the, uh, we wanted to hold Israel accountable financially in terms of aid, uh, hold them accountable for their behavior. If you do bad things that we say you shouldn't do, we're not going to give you the 3.8 billion plus every year. Um, if you don't establish accountability, bad behavior simply repeats itself, right? And gets worse. And Israel has become uh, a spoiled child in that way. They they get away with whatever they want to do and they, they have no reason to behave. Yeah. But, but on occupation, I, I understand that because you know, there there are those who are afraid of touching the the you know the what has become the third rail. You don't right. talk about Israel, but that's changing. Incidentally, it is changing um, a lot. Yeah. But what I don't get is who 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 pressured them to not put the word occupation. When I was talking with them and saying, "No, don't go there," they'd say. I remember in 1988. <clears throat> um, I wanted to introduce the word Palestinian people into the platform. And I was told, if you even put the P word in the platform, you'll destroy the Democratic Party. Where did that notion come from? I mean, who 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 says that to them? What, what are they thinking? I don't get it, get it at all. Um, that's why it's not policy at all. It's it's a pressure game of power right. politics. Is it some is it you know some big donor who says don't do it? Is it? some group that pressures them and what hold is that look i told them about the word occupation i said you will not lose five votes if you put the word occupation in the platform and you are not going to gain five votes by not putting the word occupation in the platform there's no calculus that comes i can come up with that says it's a win if we don't put that in right. the platform if we, you know I, I don't get it so i don't know what the hell they're thinking but that what they were thinking and they won because they they control the pen and he who controls the pen controls what's in the document. Right. And um, so, and your family is originally from uh, Lebanon. Right. And you have connections there. Um, your family is not in Beirut. Um, no. You told me cause I checked in. Um, can you uh, talk, do you have any friends? Are all your friends okay? I, have, I know you were I reaching out to them. I have spoken with some 
really remarkable people in Beirut that I've worked with. Um, and actually on Friday at three o'clock, I'm doing a, um, a Zoom call for people who want to tune in and listen uh, with this woman. She's a member of parliament from Beirut. She's independent. She's been fighting corruption. She's been fighting against the, the, what she calls the mafia elites who have dominated the country and ruined it and, and fighting against Hezbollah's tyranny uh, in, in the, the, the fear that they have created. Uh, but now all hands on deck to fight uh, what's happened in Beirut. And the story she told me was, were unbelievable. I have a number of, um, I have an interview with her on my Twitter account and I have uh, a number of videos and stories that I've posted on Twitter. Um, it's devastating. The entire uh, areas of the city have been destroyed and hundreds of thousands of people homeless because windows were blown out, doors were blown out. The air quality has become uh, so devastating. Um, and um, and parts of the city are now, like I said, uninhabitable. And Beirut was just a great, great place. And so much work went into rebuilding it after the, the civil war and the aerial bombardments by Israel in 82, uh, that for this to happen at a time of economic collapse and COVID-19, and one out of every five people in the country is a Syrian refugee now, uh, straining the resources, um, et cetera, uh, for this to happen with the kind of dysfunctional government that they've got, um, people are just saying, I don't know how we get out of this. I don't know how we go forward. And, and I, I just can't accept that because Lebanon cannot be allowed to die. It's too wonderful a place with too great a history and having made too great a contribution to, to, to civilization for, for it to simply, for the city of Beirut to die and for Lebanon as a country to just implode. More must be done. I remember there was a line in Death of a Salesman when, when Willie Loman is completely unraveling and his sons have rejected him and Willie's wife says to them, uh, you cannot let this happen to this man. Uh, something must be done. And, and that's how I feel about Lebanon. Something We just can't sit back and let this happen. It doesn't matter. The damn politics of it don't matter. Uh, who's in charge doesn't matter. People are... This is... This is about the size of a small nuclear weapon that hit. Um, and, um, and if it were a natural disaster, we'd do it. You right. know, or Pakistan, we'd do it. We've got to do it for Beirut. The world needs to come together and do something. And if, yeah. if, if goddamn Hezbollah decides that they're going to try to dominate everything, then the world's got to be able to say, get out of the way, man. You know, pick your fight. This is not your fight. The fight right now is saving people, saving lives, and saving that city. And um, what about the effects of sanctions? Is that harming uh, Lebanon right now? Sure, sure. But that is a problem that uh, that is uh, is real. Uh, and uh, look, I, I I I fault sanctions when they affect people, civilian populations, and they do here. Um, but I also, and I have to be fair, I, I blame Hezbollah. I blame Hezbollah. They had a choice early on. They could either be an armed militia that would use their arms against their own people, which they've done, right, going back to 2008, uh, or they could be a political party. They couldn't be both. And the notion that Hezbollah is the resistance in the South, that's what they were. That's what they were. But they have become an armed force in the country that intimidates when the protesters were protesting corruption uh, back in the fall, um, Hezbollah armed gangs went into the cities like, like Netanyahu's thugs or Trump's militias and started beating up protesters. Um, that is fundamentally wrong. And, um, and so I am opposed to them and what they do. And some folks get mad at me about it. I don't give a damn. I mean, the fact right now is that that country is hurting and, if an armed militia is standing in the way of them getting support, then armed militia should have the patriotic responsibility to say, we'll get out of the way and let the support come in um, and without threatening those who come to help us. But is that, I mean, to, to play slightly devil's advocate slash, it's kind of my orientation anyway, but isn't that something that like, um, and maybe you have a different really feeling towards this because you're of Lebanese background, but 
isn't aren't like sanctions something that the U.S. can directly affect versus um, uh, Hezbollah? Sure, but look, the problem here is that <clears throat> Hezbollah has so ingra ingrained itself in the um, in the militia in, through its militia in the economy that it's tough to separate. Um, I still think that sanctions could have been better targeted instead of going after banks. They probably should have just gone after personalities involved in Hezbollah. Um, and, and no doubt uh, there's, a, um, uh, there's a concern uh, about corruption, but nothing was being done about corruption. And corruption goes beyond Hezbollah. It goes to all, every one of the factional leaders in the country. Um, I mean, you look at the parliament today, for the most part, the names, you look at 1950 parliament, it's the same people, same, same families. I mean, you have the, this group, this group, this group, and their sons and their grandsons and their great-grandsons. Um, Lebanon's bigger and better than that. And uh, I, it was a great poem by Khalil Gibran. Uh, you have your Lebanon, I have mine. And, and it, we could say the same thing about America. You know, I mean, I have a vision and image of America. And I know that the Trump people do too. I prefer mine and they prefer theirs. Uh, I have a vision of Lebanon that rises above sect, that rises above the feudal elites, that rises above the militias that brought such destruction during the Civil War, whether it's a Christian militia or a Sunni militia or a, a Shia militia, all of them, all of them ought to go and they ought to be under the control of the central military forces uh, in the country. And they need to pick fights not fights that they don't belong. They didn't belong in Syria. They shouldn't have been sending thousands of young Lebanese to die in Syria uh, to save the regime there. It, it just, it, the whole thing just got cockeyed. And so, yeah, there are sanctions connected to Syria, connected to Iran and Hezbollah because they're so tied into both, got affected. And at that point, they had a choice to make. We're either going to operate in Lebanon as a political party to save our country, or we want to continue to be the long arm of Iran in this region, or we want to continue to be the backup support for the Syrian regime. They didn't make that choice. And so they're bringing the house down with them. And I think that, you know, I fault, of course I fault the United States for, for a heavy handed approach, but I also say that there's a responsibility that Hezbollah has too, to behave and to think better about what they're doing and the impact this is gonna have on everybody in the country. And right now the country's paralyzed. It's the government is totally dysfunctional. It can't do a damn thing. The country's in enormous need. And, you know, this is what we've got. We've got corruption and a militia combined have created a dysfunctional situation that cannot respond to save its own people and needs to have its hand out to the international community. And whatever it would take to bring the international community in, I would say that every patriotic Lebanese should say, this is what we'll do to get it because the country is going to go down otherwise and won't come back. And what about um, the situation, what's happening in, in um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Um, the, the one word I'd use to describe it is impunity. Um, Israel knows whatever they want to do, they can do, and then nobody's going to stop them because the vote in the UN will be 190 to 3, and it'll be the U.S., Israel, and maybe the Mariana Islands or some place like that. Uh, all they care about is the U.S., period. Um, and because successive American administrations, not just this one, have given them literally, we tell them don't build, they build. We say don't do this, they do it. We say don't annex, they annex. Uh, everything they've done, we've told them not to do it, they do it. And they've dug a hole so deep that they can't get out right now, and the Palestinians can't get out, and the Palestinians are paying the biggest price. And so there is no foreseeable future government of Israel that will not be in favor of maintaining the occupation. And that's partly our fault <clears throat> because we did not ever, there, if we had taken stronger positions, we would have encouraged a peace movement in Israel and, and helped sustain it, right? They would have said, yeah, we'll fight this because the U.S. is with us. But when the U.S. simply enabled bad behavior, the, the right wing gained control. And now the demonstrations against Netanyahu have nothing to do with Israel-Palestine. They have to do with his personal corruption, with his criminal behavior, with his authoritarian rule. But even those in the parliament who are opposing him, <clears throat> for the most part, do not oppose his policies. His leading rival 
wanted to right. annex more territory than he wanted to annex. And so this is this is a situation that we've helped create. We've enabled this this bad behavior. And uh, the result is Palestinians are paying a bitter price. And the Israelis have, like I said, dug a hole. There's now one state. It's an apartheid state. Right. Uh, whether you whether it's formally that or just it is that in reality, there are two people living under one rule and the one rule discriminates completely against the other people and they have no rights, no votes. And even those Arabs in Israel, the Palestinians in Israel who can vote are discriminated against by 50 plus laws that have been passed by the Knesset that treat them as second class citizens, including the new nation state law that reduces them completely to second class status. Right. I mean, you had a country here that says, if you are Jewish from any place in the world, you can come and be a citizen. But if you lived here for generations, don't even think about it. And if you live here and are a Palestinian born here, we can we can deport you um, because you're not a member of the of the Jewish people. That is racism. I, I know that people say, no, we're just defending ourselves and finding a secure. You, know, you do not create security by violently oppressing another people right. because it's going to come back and kick you in the ass. And that's what's happening. Um, and, and frankly, um, I don't know how long it takes, but you know, the, the day will come when they'll, there will be one state and it will be an Arab majority state. And they'll say, how did we get here? And I'll say, I'll tell you how you got here. Let's go back to 1990 and let's go back to 2000. Let's go back to you. You dug this hole. You had a chance to create an independent, viable Palestinian state on the 67 border. You turned it down, and we let you do it. Yeah. Um, and what else? Uh, how, how did you deal with the the, the Sanders loss? Um, and did you expect it? And and what are the lessons? Like what what's the what are the encouraging lessons from Sanders and and from Jesse Jackson's campaign? You've been with two really progressive campaigns that. Um, I don't want to say failed because I think they're, you know, especially Sanders for various reasons, you know, has really shaped a lot. But what are the encouraging takeaways? And and Reverend did too. Look, uh, I remember in 84 and 88. I mean, Reverend's just to be fair, just to be sorry. <coughs> but out of, I mean, I, I, I was a, I did camp. I was a Jesse Jackson supporter. Well, that was 88, right? When I was seven years old, big fan of Jesse Jackson. But um, I don't, that's not even a reflection of, of them as individuals as much as the time. And how well they did in the primaries. Yeah, but, yes. I, I, but I think that yeah. if you look at each one of those, were transformative movements that made America a different place when when it was over. I I had dinner with Bernie in Detroit before my wife uh, had her stroke, um, and uh, I remember sitting there um, with him, uh, listening to him with Cornell West and. Uh, Danny Glover and um, Gus Newport. Oh, I love and, him. I interviewed him. And, and Nina and Jane. And I thought to myself as I was listening to him, I said, this is a guy who knows his place in history. I mean, he is Gene Debs. He is Henry Wallace. He is a transformative revolutionary figure who is changing the face of American politics. And like Moses, he may not get to cross the river, right? But he's created a movement that will live on uh, behind him. And, um, and I think he feels that. And so I am one who has long believed that energy is never lost. It sometimes transforms itself. It sometimes moves in different directions. But I believe that it's getting worse on some levels, but it's also getting better on other levels. And I've always been, somebody said to me, how can you do this? Aren't you, don't you get down? And I say, if I ever got into this to be an, because I was an optimist, I would never do it. You know, I mean, I, I've, I've been picking fights, you know, battles that are impossible battles. I've, I fought the Democratic Party. I fought Israel and Palestine. I fought the Catholic Church. I've been fighting fights that are against way bigger foes. But I continue to believe that the impact that we make is making change possible as we go down the road. And is it better than it was 20 years ago? Absolutely. Is the pro-Palestinian? Look at what happened just this yeah. year. Jamal Bowman. They couldn't save Elliot Engel. They couldn't defeat right Rashida uh, Tlaib. They couldn't save uh, uh, Clay out in, in Missouri. They're not going to defeat yeah. Ilhan Omar. Um, this is 
a changed moment in American history. Um, and, and things are beginning to unravel for the bad guys. Um, and I'm proud to be part of it. And I think Bernie played a role. I think Jesse played a role. I think all of us have played a role. And so it's just, we're just moving on. And so, yeah, I mean, I took the defeat as I've taken defeats before as a stumbling block on the road to success. That's all. That's all. I mean, get knocked down, you get back up and you keep going. You have to, you have to just figure that, you know, stick around for another fight. I told Reverend one time I got so upset with something I said I was going to quit. And he said to me, he said, don't quit because if you quit, you give them just what they want. Mm -hmm. He said, what they're most afraid of is that you stick around and fight. And I've been fighting. And yeah. I think that's the only way to do it. And that was in 88 or more recently he said that? That one was in the 80s. Yeah, it was in the mid 80s. It was between the 84 and 88 campaigns. I was with him in 84 and uh, it was deputy campaign manager that year. And it was just, it was an mm -hmm. awesome campaign. Awesome campaign. I got to introduce him at the Democratic Convention. It was great. Wow. And when I spoke, we did a big celebration after the convention in the hotel. <laughs> and uh, I got to introduce him and I started this way. I said, I'm the son of an illegal immigrant. I'm going to nominate for president the great grandson of a slave. Where else but America? Wow. That's good. That's, right? that's good. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so, so much. Thank you so much for having um, me. Yeah. Thanks for coming on and come back. Okay. And anything else okay. you want to make sure people know about or? No. Thanks. No. Okay. Thank uh, you. You've talked about uh, d doing a <laughs> doing a, a, a memoir. I gave you yes. I gave you some gave you some I know. material. Yes, I know. Some material. I Thank know. So I'm going to record Katie. it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, Bye. Jim. Bye. Okay. Okay, guys, ready? All right. And also, don't talk smack about my guests. You can do it after if you want, but it's distracting. And I, you, you be big boys and big girls. You can deal with someone saying stuff you disagree with. All right. Or do it in an intelligent way, not knowing how i Okay. But this guy, you're not going to have anything bad to say about. Hello. Hey, Hi, how's Nando. it going? Sorry. Except maybe so sorry that you're a, an anti-Semitic misogynist, which we thought you were last really? time. Really? What did I well, do? You didn't. I had to almost cancel you because you didn't center me because you right. you'd canceled. You canceled on me. I know. And that usually is an automatic cancellation. I know. Um, you, can you center me now? I'm centering you right now. You. I'm, 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 I'm very, very sorry. I've been very busy at work lately and it's just, uh, you know, someone's got to pay the bills around here, you know? I know. Yeah. It's a lot to pay to keep this operation afloat, this seamless yeah. operation. By um, the way, Jim Zogby is great. Is someone talking shit about Jim Zogby? Yeah, because, yeah, he's for, for my audience, he's a bit of a lib. He is, he is a bit of a, he is, but yeah. But like, he was yes. blaming his ball a little bit, but yes, I think that people need to, you can like, you can you can recognize that someone is a lib, but also recognize that someone has like dedicated their Either lives do, for yeah. work, like for worthy causes, and we should yeah. have some respect for like the people who have done the work and all that yes. stuff. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well said, Nando. You know, a little yeah. bit of respect. A little bit of respect. I mean, I, I feel like this is self serving because you and I, Katie, are are uh, in our thirties. Um, so like, we're soon the kids are going to start taking over. No. You know, and if they don't show respect to us. Uh, when when we they, are the Zog I like to consider us the Zogbies of our generation. Yeah, when the Zoomers take over, uh, they're gonna they're gonna send us to a uh, to the Gulag unless they start showing some respect around yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. By the way, I'm drinking a martini. Is that cool? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I need more. I'm I'm gonna see if any if my parent maybe I, I can't take a break now because you just came on. Um, I'm sorry. What, no, it's okay. What should I play in the future though? If I need to go to the bathroom or get another drink, any ideas? Like what like, you should, should play, I, like a like, like a song, yeah, or a video. Like, or something, yeah. up in. Oh, but I need to have rights to it unless I'll donate it. it. But they're like progressive, right? They're anarchists. Oh no! I know. The tankies in the comments are going crazy. I know, going crazy yeah. Yeah. Um, what should you play? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Kelly sent play... me some music. Who? Kelly. Oh yeah. Um. And now she's texting me. You know, Kelly, I'm going to break the fourth wall. But yes, I know I got the music, but I was this was a good conversation. Icebreaker with Nando. I thought it'd be a good conversation. It was for yeah. future reference. Yeah, for future reference. Yeah. So what's going on with you? And and uh, what how it's been two weeks. I know. So, um, um, I'm in an undisclosed lo location. I'm not at home. I'm in uh, 
I'm in a bunker. I won't tell anyone where I am. Uh, I'll Are tell you, you in, in your private. Yeah, but you're but, not in the state that you're usually in? No. Okay. I'm in a different state. Um, so yeah, uh, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm just busy, but good, which is, you know, it's more than you can ask for um, in these trying times, yeah. I say, I think, you know, so how are you doing? I'm okay. I'm okay. It's really been a while that this thing has been going on and I kind of didn't realize that. Yeah. The pandemic? Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to go on for a lot longer. How much longer? Um, Can we just stop it? A year? Okay. Did you so piss off some, Jenk? Did I piss off Jenk? No, Jenk loves me. Why yeah, why? Why they say that? I think Jake loves me. He tells me he loves me every time. Maybe right me. on TY and on TYT. Oh, since I'm uh, in the bunker, yeah. Oh yeah, that's funny. No, um, Jank, Jank is a gentle, gentle giant. Gentle um, giant, yeah. He would never, yeah, no, no. I'm hiding yeah. from the libs. Yeah. The libs, they're worse than ever. They really are. I mean, what do we even want to talk about? First of all, Biden, the DNC, Chris Murphy. Let's talk about that. Oh, um, the worst. And also the the Dems just literally voting. Um, okay, I'll t I'm not going to tell you about uh, Thomas Frank is great. We're he's we're coming out with an interview with him that that uh, Matt and I did for Useful Idiots that's coming out this week, and I'll have him on the live stream. He wants to come in now. Come nice. on now. Um, he wants God. to come in in your show. <laughs> <laughs> come into the live stream. Um. But yeah, the, I mean, we're going to talk, we're bringing in Anya, someone else who wants to come in is uh, Anya Parampil, and we're bringing her on soon. But uh, let's just, and we'll talk about Chris Murphy, but let's just give a shout out to the Dems, because not only are they not putting in Medicare for All, legalizing marijuana, um, uh, what's the other one, uh, so much, Palestinians being Free human. college. Well, yeah. Being human people, being human beings, um, they voted down. I had Brent uh, Brent Welder on this week. They voted down a an amendment that like barred basically lobbyists from serving on the DNC. Um, it was an anti corruption thing, and they they were such dicks about it. They voted yeah. against it, and um, we should uh, next time uh, sometime we'll I'll play you some of the video from it. But the guy who's like. There's a corporate lobbyist who's totally trying to play the like, look, I've been involved in the D with the Dems since I was running away from the caps in Chicago. Like he's, you know, and at the uh, like totally trying to play the like, you know, use his, his leftist bona fides. Actually, yeah. let me play this. I can play this because I put it up in this video. I did an, I, I, I did a video of uh, hold on. OK, look at this vote. Oh, you're, you're going to like this. Let's watch this. All right. Um, then let's see. Okay, share screen. Hold on. Chrome. That and then video. Okay, so watch this. Can you hear that? A corporate lobbyist. Can you hear it now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, was the first person to. So this is Brent Weldner, who uh, Welder, who uh, uh, was on, who came on the show, also came into the show, and. Uh, uh, had this really good progressive amendment that as you'll see the um the 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 dnc voted against okay i'm yeah. just going to show you this but what and this is the guy this is the corporate guy who spoke against it okay so here's just the setup just so we can make fun of him of not him of, uh, entirely okay. out of politics um didn't go well. <laughs> In fact, they uh, they had a, a corporate lobbyist uh, was the first person to speak. He's against talking about my 2016 amendment, at this which, point. Um, at the time, I thought was hilarious and was probably some sort of terrible, terrible mistake. Right. Well, um, you know, I I, uh, I then uh, this time around, Bernie nominated me to the rules committee and I put forth an amendment to say that the DNC should reject corporate PAC money and ban lobbyists from serving on the DNC. We now move to proposal number seven, the proposed charter amendment to reject PAC money and banning corporate lobbyists from serving on the DNC. I will now recognize Brett Welder. So this Sorry, is a flashback. Brent Welder to offer proposal number seven. Hello and thank you. Uh, again, my name is Brent Welder. I'm from Kansas. Um, we need to neutralize corporate influence first within our party 
that is preventing us from living up to our platform, our ideals, and being a true party of the people. The party of the people cannot put profits ahead of people and remain the party of the people. People are taking to the streets in this country because they do not believe they have a voice in our democracy. We stand for healthcare for all, common sense gun reform, and clean air and water that also battles catastrophic climate change. And we stand for these things, even if it takes us speaking truth to corporate power and rejecting the money and the lobbyists from our platform and rulemaking process. And for those reasons, I strongly urge you to vote yes on this amendment. Thank you. And what do you know? The first person they, they found uh, okay, to watch this guy. Uh, speak He's such a herb. was a corporate lobbyist. And the way that I know is because he talked about it during, uh, during his speech. So I come at this with some experience in that... Uh, Dan, I've been a lobbyist uh, for many, many do-gooder groups over <clears throat> my career, and occasionally a lobbyist for for-profit corporations also. I don't think this is the place to be getting into these kinds of uh, detailed work when we have a DNC commission that has been working for 18 months and will be coming back with recommendations on these kinds of issues. Uh, so, okay, I just want to, first of all, that guy's annoying. He has a terrible accent, and uh, it doesn't have the part I thought it had in it when he's talking about his, how, what a leftist he was. But this is so, this is like peak d Dems. Like, this is what our corporate lobbyists look like. They look like they could be in a folk music band, but they're just as disgusting. Like, this guy's lobbying for, like, awful corporations. Like, yeah. this guy, Mike Kreloff, is going, yeah. like... You know, McDonald Douglas. Wait, he's not. He's Jewish, but he doesn't have a New York accent. I mean, I he has a, a Chicago, a Midwestern accent. Yeah, I just can't do it as as good as you can because yeah. you can this do. Is you can do one you, thing that I you can do. do a, yeah. you, you do a really good uh, Sh a, Chicago, really good Chicago, Chicago yeah. Jew. Um, but uh, yeah, the fact that this guy is like out there lobbying for like the worst people in the world is kind of embarrassing. You know, just that our system. You think like corporate lobbyists would be this polished kind of I know. dude with like this is yeah, you know. This guy sucks. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, the Democrats are great. I mean, they they um, somehow uh, approved the seven hundred billion dollar uh, increase in budget for the Pentagon, uh, but they included the amendment that changed the names of the bases to avoid any Confederate generals. Oh wow! So that is really yeah. that's progress. That is really progress. Look at we the get seven hundred billion dollars for the military, but they will not. Have Robert E. Lee sitting in Stonewall Jackson military right. base. Yeah. Look at speaking of which, look at this total schlub. Look at our villains, Ooh. Democrat villains, Barney, oh, Barney Frank. Frank. He's yeah, kind he of sucks. adorable, but he's like, I mean, just physically. He he, no, he sucks, but he looks like a warthog or something. Like he'd be endearing if he were good, but he's not good. And then yeah. Maria Cardona, she looks like Cruella DeVille or something. I'm looking at the I mean, she you know her, she's a lobbyist, she's Colombian. By the way, congratulations to Colombia. They they uh put what's his name? Look at her. She's uh, so Alvaro Uribe in house in, arrest. In ha under house arrest, yeah. Doesn't she looks her like she could be related tampering. to um what's her name? Uh Fernandez Rundle. Kathy Fernandez Rundle? Yeah. Doesn't she look yeah. like her, her sister? Kinda. Look at the eyelashes. Um anyway. But we should talk about the Chris Murphy thing. All right, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But look at the eyelashes. Yes. All right. Okay, well, I eyelashes, wanted to yes. wait. I wanted to awful. wait because I wanted our guest to be here and she's now here. So it's good I uh, waited. I wanted a seamless transition, and we're bringing yes. in to the show the one, the only, the hilarious uh, Anya Parampel. Hi. Hey. How are you? I'm good. How are you guys? Good, thanks. Good What's up? Welcome. Welcome. Thanks. thanks for inviting me. Do we like this or do we like this? Whatever you guys, whatever you guys What's want. You guys. So, I think that one. That yeah. one, okay. Now, yeah. Anya, uh, Nando and I are very excited to talk about Venezuela with you guys. In fact, um, Nando had a nice little tweet about did that. Did I? Yeah, I believe you did, right? I don't remember. All right, this is a this is the Katie Helper Show unplugged. Today's episode <laughs> is a little, it's extra chill. Let's see, I'm looking for a thing. Oh, nice John Kerry photos. Jesus. I did a lot of John Kerry photos today. He he's a big fan of soccer. He played on the same high school soccer team as Robert Mueller. Wow! Really? How did I not know this until today? Uh, I, yeah. But yeah. So what? yeah, you tweeted this out. Let me just show. Uh, should we have some? 
I don't remember what I tweeted, but the point is that Chris Murphy, the Democrat yeah, tell us story, senator yeah. from Connecticut, uh, yeah, that was progressive. Yeah, right. yeah. I, I remember that. Yeah, he he was basically he did like a long Twitter thread criticizing the Trump administration for its policy towards Venezuela, but it was criticizing from a position of incompetence of the management of empire, not a position of, you know, we shouldn't be doing coups in Venezuela. He's like, look at, they tried to do a coup in Venezuela and they couldn't even do that. What a bunch of idiots, you know, like organize a kind of coup. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I remember when the Democrats supported the coup in uh, Honduras and that turned out great. Oh, well, yeah. Um, Or Libya, that coup, well, I don't know if you can call it a coup, but whatever we did in Libya, um, that you can turn that into a great success from the Obama administration yeah. with booming the slavery, slave bloom, yeah. booming slavery market. So we'll they're just the worst. That, yeah. I hate them so much. The Dems. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Anya, this is something that you've looked into uh, quite a bit. In fact, you interviewed um, one of Jordan Goudreau. Who, uh, you know, was that you did? That's yeah. a good get. Oh, I know. Oh, it was for like minutes. three minutes, but she did a longer deep dive with, um, his his colleague who yeah basically has no idea where he is right he's just like a wall for him I think yeah no one knows where Jordan is did now I call think you back mm-hmm. Jordan, did Jordan ever call you back no and he ghosted they, you yeah he, and he he didn't respond to any journalists he hasn't spoken with any reporters really since the day right after this this invasion came to light or it failed and and his friends got locked up in Venezuela after trying to invade the country and kidnap or kill the president. So he's MIA, I think, because the U.S. government said that it opened an investigation into him. And so I think he realized he should probably shut up if he didn't want to get in major trouble with U.S. Gov. Uh, Of course, the U.S. government is denying they had any involvement and any real knowledge Mm -hmm. of, of his plot, which I find hard to believe for reasons we've discussed before but yeah I've, I've covered Venezuela very closely for almost two years now I spent two months there last year I've interviewed top officials from the from the real government and really gotten to know the situation there so I Chris Murphy his his Twitter thread it really just goes to show that there's not a huge difference between the Democrats and the Republicans on this issue because they're both competing for a very right wing exile base in Florida. And I don't know if either of you caught the hearing yesterday. That was kind of what sparked Chris Murphy's Twitter thread. But Elliot Abrams, Trump's That's special love. envoy to Venezuela and a an the official butcher of Central America. Yeah. Yeah, convicted war criminal, you know, running Venezuela policy. And a USAID official testified in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee yesterday. And so Chris Murphy spoke on the floor there. And then he also went on that rant on Twitter. And it was really crazy to see the Democrats were quite a bit more hawkish than the Republicans yesterday. They were really pushing Abrams, trying to criticize Trump from the right. They were calling for sanctions on Turkey for doing trade with Venezuela. Turkey actually like supplies goods that are in the clap boxes that are given out on a bi-monthly basis in Venezuela. So like oil and pasta uh, that people in Venezuela, 6 million households get for free from the government. Turkey supplies some of that, those products and Turkey has a good relationship with Venezuela. And there were Democrats that are like, this is a NATO member. How dare, how dare they do this? We should be sanctioning them more. It was pretty disturbing. I, this reminds me of uh, the Democrats always try to do this and they never, I mean, even from outside of like the moral oh, objections right. that we would have to empire, it never works even like on a narrow tactical level. And I remember the John John Kerry campaign where he tried to outflank Bush on the right uh, on Iraq saying like, I'm actually going to send more troops to Iraq and prosecute the war in a more effective way. And like, no one believes them because they're a bunch of doofuses. Right. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I, 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 what do you what do you think about what do you think is going on there? Like, do you do you think that they it's just like so deeply embedded within them that they 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 think they need to do this or 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 something else? I don't I don't even know. I don't know the answer to it. I think they believe it's a way they can appear tough in front yeah. of Republicans, and that's always the issue that Democrats have on the national stage. But it doesn't really make sense anymore because it seems obvious that the public has really rejected these all all out war 
never ending war regime change policies. And Trump was a testament to that, even though he may have been full of shit. He was definitely trying to appeal to a, an, a, a U.S. public that was fed up with the endless wars in Iraq and pointing out that these wars were a mistake. And it just is absurd now to see that the Democrats still aren't aren't uh, uh, realizing that especially their base isn't about these regime change projects, but it really just comes down to the fact that Democrats are beholden to the same corporate interests that have the desire to overthrow the Venezuelan government. We're talking about energy companies, financial institutions that would like to see a neoliberal government come into place and play ball. So I think that's what it comes down to. And unfortunately, yesterday during this hearing, the only senator, and I, I'm putting together a monologue, hopefully that will be on the gray zone soon, breaking down some of these clips, but the the only senator on the Foreign Relations Committee to call out the regime change policy was of course, Senator Rand Paul. But then he really wanted to make the point that it's socialism failing in Venezuela, yeah, and yeah. That's why they're suffering. And by the way, even Juan Guaido is a socialist. And so we shouldn't, we shouldn't replace one evil socialist with another. Yeah, like that's him. great. That's amazing. You know, Anya, you know, I'm, I'm from Miami. I know these people well. I know, uh, them, you're talking about. I know so them well. Bad. I'm intimately aware with them. They're the worst, the worst people on the planet. They, re they I mean, they remind me a lot also of Israelis in a way. They, they, well, I have the twin. Well, actually, really, the, the, the triple frontier now in Miami is the Cubans, that's the Venezuelans, and, and the Brazilians. The, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. But the Cubans. A lot of and, Bolsonaro fans. Oof. The, the Cubans and the Israelis, like, or, or Israel and Cuba are definitely similar. I talked about this with Rania. Um, um, uh, that there's a very similar dynamic in terms of there's like an APAC and then there's like Cuban APAC. And it's like, they think that that's the face of all Jews. They think it's the face of all Cubans, but it's really reactionary, powerful, yeah. not representative, overly powerful, like lobbies. I would say in the Cubans are, it's, it's more representative. It's, it's actually more than Jewish people in my experience, you know? Yeah. That weirdly, like it's more. I mean, the younger, the younger really younger like generations are changing. Yeah. But of a certain generation, it is one like, and and I'm not talking about like old people. I'm talking about people, kind of our age and above. Yeah. The young kids, the Zoomers are are good, but like beyond above us, it's like it's unanimity. There's no, yeah. there's which yeah. I think there's more dissent even in the in the American Jewish diaspora than in the Cuban. Definitely. World. Because all the Cubans came here for the same reason, which was to flee the revolution, or most of them. And I see definitely the Venezuelan community here in my in, in Miami moving to replace that Cuban base. As you say, the younger Cubans are different. They were supportive of the Obama policy of normalization with Cuba, but the Venezuelans that are coming in now are much more similar to the Cubans that came decades ago. And so they're really trying to build this lobby. Carlos Vecchio, the fake ambassador who represents Guaido here, you can just see in his deal, his Twitter account, the way he deals with members of Congress and U.S. officials that he's really trying to build this lobby. And that's really what he represents here. Not not the Venezuelan state, but the, the exile base, the exile community. And... Actually, when we were uh, defending the Venezuelan embassy last year, I was part of the Embassy Protection Collective that stayed inside trying to prevent the U.S. government from coming in and illegally turning it over to the Guaido people. There were right wing Miami Venezuelans out front with signs that would say weird things about Israel like and God. And it was just like they're part of this international right wing movement. And look at Bolsonaro being is super close to Israel, one of the main points that the Venezuelan opposition always makes is that they would reestablish diplomatic ties with Israel, which Chavez ended. And so it's really, it's just part of this right wing international front. And so there's this really nasty mentality and an attitude that comes along with it. Yeah. Uh, Nando, how's your, uh, we should, I have a Chris Murphy clip. Do you guys want to watch him? It's sure. Short. Yeah, we can watch him. All right, good. Let's see. 
Anya, Nando does a really good Brian Williams, by the way. Oh. Yeah. In fact, we should just have you read the read the um <laughs> whatchamacallit, the headlines in uh in Williamson. Okay, one second. He's the most boring guy. I can't even get over it. I, I actually watched his show for the first time in like 10 years. Because last of night. this to get to no. get another great my dad was watching it and I was like, Why are you watching? I'm I'm with my dad right now, but very um, cardboard. He's so boring. Okay, ready? Here we go. Here's this. Um, we have me, to admit. Can you hear that? Play. You can hear that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is Chris Murphy. All right. The a progressive. We have to admit that our big play, recognizing Guaido right out of the gate, and then moving quickly to implement sanctions, just didn't work. It didn't. But all we did was play all our cards on day one, and it didn't work. And it's just been. An embarrassing mistake after mistake since. First, we thought that getting Guaido to declare himself president would be enough to topple the regime. Then we thought putting aid on the border would be enough. Then we tried to sort of construct a kind of coup in April of last year, and it blew up in our face. And all the generals that were supposed to break with Maduro decided to stick with him in the end. We undermined Norway's talks last oh, week. Oh, we undermined Norway's talks. ...framework that, frankly, oh, no. is almost a carbon copy of the very one that was in front of the parties last year. And now, after wasting all of this time, um, we are stuck with elections about to happen. That is, we have talked about today, Guaido and the opposition refuse to enter. And then we are going to be in a position where we are recognizing someone as the leader of Venezuela, who doesn't control the government, who doesn't run the military, and who doesn't even hold office. At least he we admits. don't do this in other places. We don't do this in other places? We do it, it all the time. Of, but, uh, we kind yeah. of do. Does he mean it succeeds usually? I think I think what he's getting at is the whole point of that speech is just to say we have never done this overt style yeah, right. before in a way that failed so miserably we overthrow right. governments all the time but this was a little bit silly yeah and i think he's just frustrated by that and and yeah i mean it is true and that the, the the i guess the trump administration had such little knowledge of venezuela they didn't realize that not only would this fail but it really backfired i think it made the government much stronger right because, like, yeah because people who may have been you know, the the sanctions and this long, the, the, the years of, of protracted economic war and assault, it wears people down, even though they understand that they're a target of, of these, these policies and of the empire. But then it's like right when people might be getting exhausted or tired and start to wonder what, what else is there or what, what can we do? The U.S. goes and does something so brazen. It kind of caused everyone at least from what i saw not everyone but a, a lot a large group of people to rally behind the government and rally behind their country and say like how dare you do this right and why don't we know one yeah the the daniel bessner who you know katie who you had on your show tweeted out like a poll question kind of thing on his twitter in which he was like um is there any scenario in which a good kind of lefty or social democrat in the united states could inter could justify U.S. military intervention abroad, and I was like shocked at the results. Like, the, like it was like I, because I'm like, no, I can't, I can't imagine a scenario. What, what were the today's. options? It was a yes or no. Oh, oh yeah. okay. Like, can you imagine a scenario in which you would? And I was like, with the current U.S. war machine, a no, lot of people like, said yes. Yes, like over fifty percent. What did they say? Not a, no, no. It was yes or it was yes or no. Um, so oh right, but didn't they expand on it? Some of them in the comments expanded on it, and it's like they're they're a lot of people are like making like the Hitler thing, you know, like if you're if you know you can send military troops military troops to liberate Auschwitz and stuff like that. But like first of all, that's a different military war machine than the one we currently have, and it's like just a, but like in today's world in twenty twenty. Can you imagine a thing that would happen in the world that would justify sending the U.S. military to deal with whatever thing? And I said, no. Like, I can't imagine a scenario in which, like, the U.S. military wouldn't only cause death, right. destruction, make everything worse. Um, it's literally unimaginable to me. But yeah, I thought we'd establish that by now. 
Yeah, but I mean, you know, like Daniel Bess was like a left wing guy. His followers are all left wing people. Like it's not like there was a bunch of uh, right wingers kind of weighing in on the poll. But I was I was surprised at the results. Hmm. We gotta have Daniel on to talk about it. Yeah. Um. And uh, when I, I Anya, did you feel better when you when you learned that like because because Jordan basically Nando, you don't know this, but Jordan talked to Anya for a few minutes and then said he'd call her back. And and never did. Yeah. How often does that happen but to then, us? But then Ladies, I'm wondering. I hate if, it when they do that. It's the worst. It's only happened once to me. But I was wondering if you, um, uh, if that made you feel better, knowing it wasn't just you, knowing that like he wouldn't talk to any other journalist. Definitely, absolutely. validating. Totally. I, you know, he's got to save his, save his behind. I, I get it. <laughs> I thought it's not you. It's, uh, I, I was hoping it. that he was going to throw the U.S. government and everybody that he dealt with under the bus, but I think yeah. he was feeling as though he could be thrown in jail any minute. He decided that wasn't a good move. Yeah, you my were favorite, really my favorite part about that whole story is that the the mercenaries took their passports with them. Yeah, on the operation, it's like it's the dumbest thing that's maybe ever happened in human history. Yeah, and then they, in their interviews with the Venezuelan security forces afterwards, they're saying that they were all, they were gonna gonna get paid like a hundred and sixty grand or something like that each, which is nothing for what they were doing. And the contract I think was five million dollars, so it's kind of they're getting, they're getting they were just so ready to do that for a really small amount of money. <laughs> oh, there's Matt. Max, tell Max to come on. Tell Max he's he wants working. to come on. He showed his face. He's letting the cat in. Okay, mm. and then he, and then can you come on with the cat? Yeah, bring the cat. Yeah, Doctor Evil. She is a very Doctor Evil esque cat. Oh, I meant Max, but yeah, the cat too. Yeah, Hi, Max. Cute. That's Zelda. Hi, Zelda. What's the name? Zelda is the name of the cat. Yeah. Is it a female cat or a male cat? Because a lot, a lot of confusion with Zelda. Link is the guy. Zelda is the woman. Oh, she's named after F. Scott Fitzgerald's wife. And oh, Zelda so you're did not, not right. end the woman. Well not the her. Nintendo game. Not no, it Nintendo didn't game. end well for her. It's really a tragic story. Yeah, yeah. wow. You're condemning her to a quite she a. Was real, she was reincarnated as this little cat. Oh, yeah. I got to bring Bodhi on next time. Um, And what else are you. Are you? It's a pretty. It's cute for a cat. I don't really like cats, but that's. You don't like cat. cats? No, but that's a cute cat. I mean, I, I, I'm not offended by it. You can keep holding it. Like, <laughs> You're, a the wall. You're a dog. I am a dog person, yeah. I should ask my mom to bring in the dog, yeah. Um, and what else are you working on? Well, I'm doing this little monologue about the hearing, and I recently published an investigation. Now I have cat hair all over me. Um, I published an investigation exposing uh, one of Guaido's officials, his former attorney general, his name is Jose Ignacio Hernandez. Uh, and basically, this is like the second time that I've really gone after him because I found that he's just like a paid mercenary, legal mercenary who's repeatedly been hired by companies, large corporations that are suing Venezuela's government in court, U.S. court. And he was doing all this before he was appointed as Guaido's attorney general. But then after he was appointed as Guaido's attorney general, essentially switching sides, right? He's representing the government now that's sued by all these companies that were paying him. He started taking actions that helped all the legal cases of these companies, a Canadian mining firm that was suing the Venezuelan government and also these like a whole group of oil companies that that were suing or that the Venezuelan government was actually suing for damages. And because of his actions, now Venezuela's largest international asset Sitgo, which you all know is a gas station. Yeah. Which is a subsidiary. Boston Red Sox over the Boston, over the Fenway Park. You see the big Sitgo sign. Yeah. And there's refineries. If you take the Amtrak or something like that, you'll see the big Sitgo refineries outside of New York. But it's a subsidiary of Venezuela's state oil company. It's a private U.S. company, but it's down the line owned by Petroleos de Venezuela, PDVSA. And so... Because of the actions this attorney general took, Sitgo will likely be liquidated, sold off to other oil giants in order to pay back all these companies that were suing 
Venezuela's government, which just so happened were was paying this prosecutor. So he was double t dealing, super corrupt. That's what I've been focused on. Well, two two questions. One, uh, how do you find all this information out without revealing your sources? Like, do you like, uh, how does one figure this out? Two, second question. Um, Juan Guaido goes around with a full-time astrologer. And can you do an investigation on that? <laughs> I really want to know. I thought that was just code for his like, CIA handler or something. <laughs> Which would be amazing. Yeah. If you broke that story, that would be amazing. But I probably would have to be go back to Venezuela to do that. Um, as for the these investigations, it's it's interesting actually. I, I speak about it. I write about it openly in my first expose of Jose Ignacio Hernandez about the Citgo conspiracy. Really, how he was paid by these companies that are now forcing the liquidation of Citgo. Venezuela is again most expensive highest valued international asset their pride and glory on the international stage and now it'll all be lost very likely due to this man uh, it's because interestingly enough people in the opposition came to me people right. who are not in guido's party but are in other opposition parties that actually participate in the democratic processes in venezuela so for example, in 2018, when Maduro ran, all of the U.S.-backed parties, including Juan Guaido's party, Voluntad Popular, Popular Will, and a host of other parties boycotted the election because they wanted to give the appearance that Maduro was preventing all of the opposition and all of the parties, anybody challenging him from participating. Just they wanted to make it look like only one man was running, right? But there were some parties that didn't go along with that U.S. order. One of them is a progressive advance. And actually, the candidate who ran against Maduro, Henri Falcone, he's anti-Chavista, anti-Maduro. But he was threatened by the U.S. government with sanctions for participating in the election, right? Because they just want to invalidate the process altogether. But... There, so there are these demo, these these opposition forces in Venezuela that actually want to participate in the gov in the government. They want to run for office. Yeah. They don't just want to be paralyzed by these U.S. backed hooligans that are essentially throwing flames on their system constantly and paralyzing it by demanding a boycott. And so these people are very fed up with Guaido and his his affiliates. And so they came to me and just they sent me down a path where I had to read a lot of court documents and uh, legal dockets and come up with the name, like find where, like the testimony of this man and, and it was there and then how much he was paid. I mean, it was all in the court records for the public to see. So that's how I kind of got turned on to it. And then it's just like a never, a never ending spiral pretty much. There, it just seems like there's always something uh, with with these guys, I, I and I, I I really enjoy going after them. I'm I was sad. I was kind of sad when Ricardo Hausman resigned, just because it was so fun to badger him constantly. But I was also happy to have. Is that the father of that woman who did the New York Hausman? Times video? Yes, with Joanna Hausman, and then she didn't disclose the fact that her father was a, an official in the coup government. She's very good impersonations, actually. She is. I'll give her that much. Yeah. That, but, that, um, why? That's all that, that, and that's all that matters. Yeah, I'm yeah. just saying. Oh, because she's a comedian. I'm just saying that. You know. I, I, no, I, I respect it. I'm, I'm being yeah. serious. No, no. Before I know you have to go, and also because Anya and I have to play. We have to talk about our, our boyfriend John Bolton. But any final <laughs> impersonations you want to do? Not final. Oh. Any in general. Can you just read us something, Brian Williams? The voice? real problem with the Venezuelan government is that they're not respecting trans rights. Is my <laughs> Brian that's Williams? Woke. That's woke. We gotta do our woke Brian Williams. Woke yeah, last, Brian Williams. Last time we were on, we talked about how Black lives do matter, and we have heard in your Venezuela. Voices. It's very clear that Black lives do not matter. Their president and their entire cabinet is cis het white male anti-black racist which is yes. why we at msnbc are bringing you joanne reed <laughs> joanne reed exactly it was organic when we did it last time yeah 
um, because he, we happen to have a Joanne Reed thing too. The irreality. Um, okay, well, thank you, Nando, Hi, for joining great. us. Oh, Marxist Nixon. Can you do Nixon? Uh, I probably could. Have to work <laughs> uh, on it, yeah. Yeah, I have to work on it. Yeah. Give me next week. I'll do Marxist. All right, Marxist Nixon they want. All right, I'll do All it. Right, bye, Nando. Take it easy. Bye. Bye-bye. Anya, any, what do you want to talk about? Anything on your mind? Uh, I'm glad Rania's okay. Yeah, I know. I was scared when I woke up, but by then she'd already messaged me a bunch of times. It was freaky, though, that she tweeted out. You saw the picture of, like, where she had been sitting to work, and there was a huge yeah. shard of glass. And there's a huge what? Shard of glass, you said? Shard of glass, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's really terrifying. Just, just think about anybody in the wrong place the wrong time. Well, what's so weird is, and this is on my um, inter interview uh, with Rania, she says during our interview, which I pre-taped on Sunday, she's like, I'm really, I'm really, I'm trying to remember her, her imagine her voice, but she's always like, I'm Are really, in first name, I'm really glad that, um, and she says she's really glad that her electricity hadn't gone out because it goes out all the time. Mm -hmm. And she was glad that we could go in, you know, cause she, we, even when we were planning the interview, she was like, um, well, we should do it then make sure the, you know, electricity is on. And during the interview, she's, I asked her about Lebanon, like right as we're ending the, the interview and she's like, it's really bad here. It's only going to get worse. And the power outages, it's like, you know, a million degrees and there's no AC. And actually I'm really glad the power didn't go out. And then I guess she wasn't home because she, because there was a power outage. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's why she wasn't home. Yeah. I'm, I is, I mean, I have a few friends in Beirut that I, I was worried about, but they're all safe. Fortunately, it's just the, the sad thing is, I guess the city will never be the same. I don't know if there's enough glass and now the port was destroyed and they're, they're rely completely on imports to feed the country, but also, just to rebuild, how are you, how are they going to do that? And, and they were already going through so much. It's just really unfair and sad. And it's a tragedy. I don't, I don't have anything super articulate to say. About do we it. know what it, are, it was? It just a, an, an accident. Is that what people think? So far, that's what it seems. Obviously a lot of people jumped to the, to, to call out Israel just because Israel is always, sabotaging in the region but i haven't seen any i haven't seen any evidence that they were involved in the lebanese security services are saying it was an accident and hezbollah you know you'd think if they really thought it was israel there was evidence that they would they would make some sort of statement but since that hasn't happened i'm right I, I'm just i mean rania could talk about it much more articulately and with, with more authority than I can, but I know she tells me that she she's not surprised that it would be government incompetence that would right. that would lead to something like this, unfortunately. Yeah. Um and uh I'm trying to see if there do you want to do that? What was that thing we were gonna do? Playing um it was gonna be John Bolton. Like flipping to a random yeah. page and reading the drama. Yeah. Do you have the book? I can go I, find it. Yeah I have I have it open with um you know oh, Amazon, you know, okay. yeah. um, Let's see. Um, do you want to grab yours or we can both do it on this? I'll I grab guess. Okay. Well, so we can each do one. Okay. So what's going on? Everyone says that it's um there's some Wi-Fi problems. Yeah, Nando is a is a uh, smart and gorgeous lad. Okay. So what what should happen? You you're just gonna you're just gonna Oh, randomly open, open random okay. page and read. Yeah, and then I will do. Um, yeah, Anya did buy the book, and I will do. Just I'll just scroll to a random thing and read. Okay. All right. So I'll just open it. <gasps> checking into the Hanoi Hilton, then checking out, and the Pan Moonjom playtime. That's the chapter. I guess it's about negotiations with. DPRK, judging from the title. When in the 2018 congressional, okay, sorry, starting that over. When the 2018 congressional elections concluded, another Trump Kim summit looked depressingly inescapable. <laughs> he doesn't want diplomacy to happen. Right. Trump's fascin fascination with obtaining a deal with the North 
waxed and waned. But with over six months having passed since the Singapore summit and nothing much happening, waxing was becoming ascendant. Pompeo was to meet with North Korea's Kim Jong-chol in New York on Thursday, November 8th, and Kim wanted another White House meeting that day or the next. Fortunately, I would be in Paris preparing for Trump's upcoming visit, so there would be no repeat of the spring 2018 scene. It still turned my stomach to imagine Kim Jong-chol back in the Oval. Then, mercifully, Kim Jong-un canceled the trip. Prospects for a Moon Kim summit were also going nowhere, at best being kicked into 2019. So I guess the takeaway there is that he just really doesn't want any engagement, any diplomatic initiatives to succeed or happen even. He doesn't want an attempt. We're reading John Bolton's book. Yes. Yeah. So he sucks. He sucks. All right. I opened up to a random page. Ready? Okay, so the takeaway from that is he sucks and doesn't like this diplomacy, right? He doesn't even want meetings to happen. He's kind meetings. of racist. He's like, my stomach churned at the thought of those North Koreans and the. Oval. I mean, he called it a shithole country, right? Yeah, he did. No, oh, that was like the best you told us. A about. rat shit, little. A rat shit. <laughs> He's way worse than Trump. Okay, so, um, all right, let's see. Um,. Running into Sean Spicer in the hallway and then later vice... Wait, hold on. Sorry. One second. Okay. One second. Life God, under... Eat some kimchi. I love kimchi. kimchi. Okay. Let's see. Something good. Something good. But yeah, something good. Ready? I, okay. Um, I had a perfectly pleasant lunch with McMaster discussing Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. And we then went to the Oval Office, to the Oval, to see Trump, who was just finishing lunch with Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin oh. and Nelson Peltz, a New York financier. Trump was sitting behind the resolute desk, which was completely bare, unlike the desk in his New York office, which seemed always covered with newspapers, reports, and notes. He had a picture taken of the two of us, and then McMaster and I sat down in front of the desk for our discussion. We talked a bit about the Obamacare repeal effort and then turned to Iran and North Korea, repeating much of the ground McMaster and I had covered at lunch. Trump said, you know, you and I agree on almost everything except Iraq. And I replied, Yes, but even there, we agree that Obama's withdrawal of American forces in 2011 led us to the mess we have there now. Trump then said, not now, but at the right time and for the right position. I'm going to ask you to come into this administration and you're going to agree, right? I laughed, as did Trump and McMaster, although I felt somewhat uncomfortable on his behalf and answered, sure, figuring I had again dodged the bullet I had feared. No pressure, no rush, and no amorphous White House job without an inbox. So he he's he's fronting like he didn't want the job. I know. Even though he took it. So what was and there a gun like, to his oh, head? Master, I'm gonna replace you. Sorry. The, the, me the meeting lasted about 20 minutes, 20 plus minutes. And then McMaster and I left, stopping by Bannon's office on the way out. Bannon and I visited for a while with Priebus running into Sean Spicer in the hallway and then later the vice president who greeted me warmly. The atmosphere reminded me of a college dorm with people wandering in and out of each other's rooms, chatting about one thing or another. Weren't these people in the middle of a crisis trying to repeal Obamacare, one of Trump's signature 2016 issues? This was not a White House I recognized from past administrations, that's for sure. The most ominous thing I heard was Mike Pence saying, I'm really glad you're coming in, which was not what I thought I was doing. I finally left at about 2.15, but I had the feeling I, would have, I could have hung out all afternoon. I could see the pattern of contact with the Trump White House lasting for an indefinite period, and to an extent it did. But I ended the administration's first hundred days secure in my own mind about what I was prepared to do and what I wasn't. After all, as Cato the Younger says in one of George Washington's favorite lines from his favorite play, when vice prevails and impious men bear sway, the post of honor is a private station. Wow. 
That's kind of funny to imagine the White House as though it's a college dorm and they're all just like, hey, man, what's going on? It's, it's kind of fun almost. I mean, I'm sure I would laugh a lot at Trump, but not not intent. I mean, not what he was doing intentionally. Did you see his interview with Axios the other day? Oh, no, I know I need to. What What was What did he is that when he would like wouldn't praise John Lewis, among other things? I think so. Yeah, he wouldn't do that. He's just I'm trying to remember. He did so many really. Let's say, well, wait, fun here. Let's watch some of this things. All right. We got if you I just got. put it on. Yeah, I will. You'll see that it's really funny. All right. Let's see. Is this now this? I don't want to watch them now this thing. And it's going to be like. No audio and just text. That'll be annoying. Yeah, it'll be like, doo, 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 doo. That's so annoying. Hold on. When I'm listening to Bolton's words, I get the same feeling I get when I've eaten too much ham. That's what somebody commented. He looks, yeah, he kind of, he looks like some, what does he look like also? He looks like some weird muskrat or something. He really does. All right, let's see. Very infected. Thank you so much for having us. We look at your other here, Mr. President. Thank you. Oh my God! Then we have to watch Biden, Biden's thing from today. With the, yeah. Uh, with the reporter. Okay, let's see what happened. Look at that hair. Okay. Everything. Mr. I President, love how thank he like you for joining us. Thank forward. You we appreciate room. you taking the time. We appreciate <laughs> your commitment to answer our questions. Sure. Appreciate that. Over the years, I've heard you I do talk love the way he about. Sits your adherence to a philosophy called positive thinking. This is the mantra that if you believe something, if you visualize it. Oh my God, we're getting self-help uh, from Trump. I had no idea. To an extent, I also think in terms of the downside. Right. Uh, I do, I've, I've been given a lot of credit for positive thinking, but I also think about downside because only a fool doesn't. To what extent do you think that that positive thinking mindset is suitable to handling the worst mm -hmm. pandemic? that we've seen in a century. I think you have to have a positive outlook. Otherwise, you would have nothing without a positive outlook. I think we've done an incredible job oh between the God. ventilators and stopping very infected people from China <laughs> coming in, meaning putting the ban on China. The ban. Nobody There's a funny to part when they're talking, when you ask the COVID part, they start talking January. about Afghanistan, uh, the Afghan bounty story, not which an easy thing to do. I guess just hasn't died. It's a big thing. We would have uh, right, probably listen. lost hundreds of thousands of lives more had I not done that. And all of the experts, every one of them, not one of them. Because he made a really funny point. Severe. Any idea where well, it is? Three months later. Uh, it may be like probably six minutes in, seven, seven minutes in. Like oh, my God. Look at the I mean, hair. Nobody knew the extent. Nobody knew how contagious I'm not, I'm it was. Not. It's a month later. But Tulsa was a very he'll good put, He'll pivot to Afghanistan well whenever the COVID part ends. So it's probably a third of the way in. Does he ask him about... It was uh, Herman Cain. I have a we photo of Herman Cain. He does not. We had tremendous response. You think? You couldn't even. It was like an armed camp. You couldn't even get through. You couldn't get anybody in. Look but at his face. He looks like he's out of a Christopher Guest uh, movie. We had that nobody wants to talk about. So Fox broadcast it. It was the highest rating in the history of Fox Television. Saturday night. Doesn't his face look like he's an actor, rating. like in, in character? Nice well, wait a minute. You're Trump or Jonathan yeah. Swan? That Swan. Yeah, I mean, I, in the history of Fox Television on Saturday it's night. And nobody says I think, that. I think you misunderstand me. I'm criticizing your ability to draw a crowd. Are well, you kidding me? I'm I've covered you for five years. You draw massive I'm crowds. You get this. huge ratings. I'm asking about the public the time, health. And I canceled another one. I had to cancel it. Right. Look at the way he's sitting. I know. He's sure like ready to go. For the same reason. But here's the question. He, he looks like a big I've ham, actually. For a long time. I've, I've gone to your rallies. Maybe I've talked to your people. They love you. Minutes. Unless you want to hear more of the COVID. Every word you say that. Hang on your head. Do you think he's like. They think we're fake news. They want to get their advice He's good. He's very good at seducing him, right? We Jonathan, a yeah, yeah. He, did a, he did a good job. Yeah, I mean, I wish he hadn't brought up the. Thing. I wish he and asking about Herman Cain would have been eleven million nice. pests. and uh, he spent a lot of time on the Afghan bounty story, which of half the what story? Uh, Sorry, the you know the uh, that the tal Russia was paying the tal oh yeah 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 South Korea. the bounty gate we even, yeah. bounty gate. United States. Oh my God! Go oh, he loves his little chart as a proportion of population. Somebody. What it says is when you have somebody that yeah. has it where there's a case, oh, okay. the people that live sure. from oh. those cases. It's surely a relevant statistic to say if the U.S. has X population. 
It oh was. God. It's it's a thousand yeah. a day. It was two and a half thousand. It went down to five hundred. Now it's going up yeah. again. Excuse me. Where it was is much higher than where it is right now. It went down and it went up like, again. But now it's going down again. It's, it's going, going up. down in Arizona. It's going down in Florida. Nationally, it's, it's going, going down up. in Texas. Take a look at this. These are the tests. It's going down in Florida. Yeah, it's going. It leveled out and it's going down. That's my report as of yesterday. Anyway, Miss. All right, let's the Bush see. administration. Is this it? Some of them, not any friends of mine. It is this it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, here we go. Right. I'll have to see those. But but you have to look at this. This is the number of tests compared. I to I don't the rest deny of the your world. figures. You've done more tests by far than the rest right. of the world. I don't and deny because that. we've done more. He, gets, tests, he, more he makes a really funny point that yeah. I just more check, check it out. Mr. President, um, different subject. It's been widely reported look that the U.S. has intelligence indicating that Russia paid bounties. <laughs> or offered to pay bounties to Taliban fighters to kill American yeah. soldiers. Mm -hmm. You had a phone call with Vladimir Putin on July 23rd. Putin. Did you bring up this issue? No, that was a phone call to discuss other things. And frankly, uh, that's an issue that uh, many people said was uh, fake news. He said it was, was fake news. I think a lot of people, uh, if you look at some of the, the wonderful people, folks right? from the Bush yeah, administration, even the intelligence agents some of them, the not any friends of mine, like low were saying that this is a fake issue. That's why I didn't a really get high, high up in the There was well, we had a call, we had a call talking about nuclear proliferation, which right. is a very big subject, where they would like to do something. Yeah, so that's great, right? We discussed numerous things. We did not discuss that. And you've never discussed it with him? I have never discussed it with him. I would. I have no problem with it. But you don't believe the intelligence. It's because you don't believe the intelligence. No, but there's some intelligence that says it's not that yeah, happening. Trump, you know, Trump's not even smart enough to make that China. point. That's bring Russia, 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 Russia. You could have easily owned if it. If we can do something with Russia yeah. in terms of nuclear there's proliferation, really which right. is a very big problem, bigger problem than global warming, right. a much bigger problem than global warming what is? in terms of the real world. Nuclear proliferation. Uh, it never reached my okay. desk. You know why? Because they didn't think it was intelligence. They didn't think it was real. It was in they your written brief. Uh, they didn't think it was worthy of it. I wouldn't mind. If it reached my desk, I would have done something about it. It never reached my desk because. Do you read your written brief? I do. do I you? read a lot. Really? You know, I read a lot. They like to say I don't read. I read a lot. Uh, your your I, daily I intelligence brief. I extraordinarily well, uh, probably better than anybody that you've interviewed in a long time. Uh, I read a lot. I spend a lot of time with like, uh, even at better. meetings, uh, at usually meetings. once a day or. Uh, at least two or three I times a week lot in Delhi. Because this was apparently talking in about world. India, right. talking about right. with the problems with China, talking about so many different elements of the world. Mm -hmm. The world is a very uh, angry place. If you look all over the <laughs> more world, more self-help Trump. We call up. I get. Uh, I see twenty-two soldiers were killed in India with China fighting over the border. It's been raging for many, many decades. And they've been fighting and back and forth. I, I have so many briefings on so many different countries, but this one didn't reach my desk. <laughs> the reason I say this is, is even if you don't believe the this particular piece of intelligence, and there is dispute, no doubt there is dispute in the intelligence community about it. Your I former, don't think Trump is uh, that angry John in this, Nicholson, actually. former head of forces in Afghanistan, said, and this is when he was working for you, that Russia is supplying weapons Here to the Taliban. Isn't that enough to challenge Putin over the killings of well, U.S. We soldiers? Well, we weapons when they were fighting Russia too. You know, when we were when they were fighting with the Taliban when yeah, in that, Afghanistan. It's a different era. Well, it's a different. I'm just she saying. She said that we but does that mean, the Taliban I'm too. We did that too. But how does that? I don't happen? know. I didn't ask Nicholson about that. He was there for a long time. Didn't have great success because you know he was there before me, and then ultimately I made a change. But you should know the history right? lesson. I mean, it's well known in the intelligence community um, that they're arming the Taliban, Russia. It's not uh, well known in the intelligence I don't community. Know. When you say arming. Is supplying weapons. Or they Russia is supplying weapons uh, and money to the Taliban. I have heard that. Guys, hold on. People never, talking again, shit in the chat. It's never this is Anya from he said it on the, the Gray Zone. I have on Anya, Aaron Mate, Max Blumenthal. I think it's okay if we watch some of this and you don't think I'm being a fucking Russiagate fanaticist. Fa fanatic. Ooh, why are they mad? I don't know. They're like, oh, Russia again? And I didn't come here to watch this crap. We never watched Trump. So please allow that. me to watch. Russia doesn't want anything to do with Afghanistan. Let me just Is this what you're talking Russia. about, Anya? Russia used to be a thing called the Soviet Union. Because of Afghanistan, they went bankrupt. They became Russia, just so you do understand, okay? The last thing that Russia wants to do is get too much involved with Afghanistan. Anyway, I didn't know they, I didn't know it was upsetting. Last question on this subject. And by the way, we're no, largely it, out of it? Afghanistan. I'm being too touchy. Well, I wanted to ask you about that. Um, Sorry. The, the U.S. Katie, troop level in Afghanistan right now is roughly anyway, the same. So, so yeah. I thought it was funny. I thought it was funny that when they brought up 
Russia supplying weapons to the Taliban. He's like, you know, we did that too when I they know, were fighting well, Russia. It's well, like, Trump. I, just, I, I, I love it when he he just says it. Hold on, did you see this? We're watching it ironically. Yeah, cool. It's funny, you guys. Come on. Mr. Yeah. Vice President, your opponent. Okay, this is good. Did you see this? Yeah. You thought? Should we watch it again, though? Yeah, of course. All right. Mr. Vice President, your opponent in this election, President Trump, has made your mental state a like, campaign topic. And when asked in June if you'd been tested um, for cognitive decline, you've responded that you're constantly tested in, in, in effect because you're in situations like this on the campaign trail. But please clarify specifically, have you taken a cognitive no, test? No, I haven't taken a test. Why the hell would I take a test? Come on, man. That's like saying you, before you got in this program, you take a test where you're taking cocaine or not. What do you think, huh? Are, are you a junkie? What do you say to President Trump <laughs> junkie. who Why brags that word about mind mind? and makes your mental state an issue for voters? Okay, here's where it gets good. Well, if yeah, you this can't is figure out the difference between an elephant and a lion, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. Did you watch that? Look, come on, man. I, I, I know you're trying to goad me, but I mean... I'm so forward looking to have an opportunity to sit with the president or stand with the president in debates. There are going to be plenty of time. And by the way, as I joke with him, you know, it, I, I shouldn't say it. I'm going to say something I don't, I, I probably shouldn't say. Anyway, I am, uh, I am very willing to let the American public judge my physical and mental, my physical as well as my mental fitness. And uh, to, uh, you know, to make a judgment about who I am. Oh, my God. Hey. The debates are going to be really ugly. I can't wait. I mean, it's going to be I don't think they'll sway the vote too much one no. way or another, but they're going to be so entertaining. Yeah, they are. I know. I, I it'll be like Trump's final blaze of glory. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know why. Why did he go straight to the cocaine question? Like it was so out of the blue. I know, I know, it was. You think? Oh. He, but I, was it prepared? You never know what's prepared or not. Yeah, they were like, if they ask you about cognitive yeah. function, accuse the black host of being a junkie. Yeah, yeah, but exactly. make sure to be fair, is cocaine not crack? So that was very respectful. I guess because he's a journalist, so people think that. Oh yeah, right. But like. I thought he was just trying to, you know, not play into the. I, I thought he yeah. didn't want to be stereotypical. Yeah, and then why did he do the whole? You know what I joke about with him. I, I'm saying something I probably shouldn't say. Do you think there's somebody like behind the camera going? Yeah, there probably is someone in his earpiece saying, "Wrap it." Joe. Yeah, he did that a bunch Here. during the during the uh, debates. He right. was like, "Oh, and I'll yield my time." It's like, what you talk like? You yeah, have, you have no what sense or no. I think there was like a conspiracy that George Bush did some of his debates with an earpiece coach. Oh, actually, hold on. There's actually a really funny thing. Hold on. But isn't it just obvious that Biden's going to have to do that? And like how much Adderall do they give him before? His, his I mean, I think he sleeps for forever. And then, um, hold on a second. And then, yeah. Hold on. Yeah, this is pretty good. I shouldn't say it's like you already did it, man. You should just keep going, you know. Well, this Have is kind of funny. Here. I don't know if it's aged well. I think it has. Some of it's not funny, but here, let's just watch a little bit of this. Is it George? It's uh it's a, a video with George, yeah. Hold on. I someone said it's abuse to me. I agree. I feel like Biden's campaign is elder abuse. It is elder abuse, yeah. If I were his wife or his children, I would not be allowing this to happen. Well, I think Hunter's a little has to put himself first. He, well, Hunter, Hunter, is an Hunter has to practice life. radical self care. Yeah, that's what I actually saying. feel really bad for him. <laughs> can you guys hear it? You can, right? Mm hmm. Families is where our nation finds hope, where wings take dream. Fam I think that when people hear the president speak, this frankly, they think he's really stupid. If you don't stand for anything, you don't stand for anything. If you don't stand for something, you don't stand for anything. But what people don't realize is that there is a genius behind the stupidity. Fool me once. Shame on 
Shame on you. If fool me, we can't get fooled again. Yes. And that genius is Harlan McRaney. Ooh, we can't get fooled Ready. again. I wrote that. You have to understand one thing about the American people. They are not interested oh. in a politician that speaks dated, but... smoothly or uh, who insists on using real words or who uh, can actually talk. In my state of the my state of the union or state my speech to the nation, whatever you want to call it. The American people of today's Americas want a politician who can speak their language and speak it badly. Then you wake up at the high school level and find out that the liter literacy level of our children are appalling. I like to start the whole process by writing my ideas on index cards. Then I concentrate on pinpointing the best ones. This is Andy Dick, by the way. People and then know. finally, I take those ideas uh, home with me. I remember. So and stupid. I sleep on them. That's so stupid, but it's kind of Literally. Funny. When I wake up in the morning, I see what sticks, and bingo, I have a speech. I know the human being and fish can coexist peacefully. I find that the best speeches are the ones that... Uh, Put on your family. ...to speak to the people. No word okay, is to speak to the people. And what speaks louder than words? No words. 90 second response, Mr. President. Mr. President, can you hear me? This is the target. Testing. One, two, Mr. President, can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me now? Oh, he's kind of adorable. Is better? Better? Yeah, better. 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 Good. Is that good? Okay, don't say Clearly anything. Clearly for Ross. Don't say anything. Just hold it. Just hold it. Don't. He doesn't hold, keep it, hold, it. hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold, hold. Um, don't say anything. Just hold it, hold it, hold it. Now start blinking a lot. <laughs> just start blinking. That's it. Holy crap! That's a lot of blinking. Okay, that's it. Good. Now hold, hold it, hold it one more time. Hold it, hold it, hold, hold it. One more time, one more second, hold it and talk. The only thing consistent no, about no, no, my- No, 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 stop, stop, stop. <laughs> hold it, one more second, hold it and talk, talk. Talk. Opponent's position is that he's been inconsistent. My hope anyway. is that my- Oh, no, we're Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for that first video. Yeah, sorry, I lost connection. Yeah, okay. I was worried for a second. I just riffed on the comments, but um, you know, what was so weird is when Bush, when Trump, I'm sorry, when Trump was starting out, and people were like, I can't believe someone so incoherent and stupid and inarticulate could rise and the people are going for it. And I was like, first of all, Sarah Palin was running for vice president, what, eight years ago. And second, does anybody not remember George Bush? Like Bush, Bush puts Trump to shame in terms of the crazy shit that he said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And still has more blood on his hands. Although, no, no. I guess now the body count. No, because COVID. COVID. I mean, millions of Iraqis. Though. Yeah, it still has it does have a lower body count. Yeah, but definitely, I I I miss all those Bush clips. They were so good. I remember I, I was addicted to watching them back in the day, and I had maybe for like 2004, 2005, I had a calendar of Bushisms that was every oh, month. Yeah. Of Bush saying, and I think I still have it in my mom's attic somewhere. But it was really entertaining. He had some great. Great lines, you know, food on your family. Yeah. Um, wings take where um, wings take hope. What is it? <laughs> I forget that one. 
What is the what are the commenters' favorite Bushisms? Oh yeah, it's a good question. I'm looking for him where he talks about his art. Oh. With Ellen or something? No, who is it with his parent? It's like see his daughter takes play it uh, takes part in it too, and his wife. What's her name? Jenna. Oh, Jenna, yeah, I think so. Let's see. Have you been following the scandal with Ellen? Oh no, not really. Have you? I need to know about it though. Not what happened? Closely. I'm just kind of entertained by the idea that her she had a hostile work environment and that people of color who worked on her show were not very happy. Oh. And that other people from the industry have come out to criticize her just because she's this phony, all inclusive right. lady who loves George Bush. I would love to see her go down. I'm the decider. Yeah, that was classic. Oh, here, you want to watch him talking to, to Ellen? We got some footage of him talking about his art with Ellen. Georgie, why not? Right. Screw Ellen. Turns out Ellen might be a sociopath. Yeah, shocker. She's very good with kids, I gotta say. Okay, let's see. How do you know? Oh, because of her show? Yeah. Because I, I have... She's babysat my nieces. And yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Is our children learning? Yes! Rarely is the question asked, is our children learning? Um, you gotta ask it more. What else did he say? I know how hard it is for you to put food on your families. Home is where, where wings take dream. All right. I told you I was looking in those eyes. All right. Beautiful blue. I'm waiting for you to paint me. I want you to yeah, paint me. I told you I was looking in those eyes. All right. Beautiful blue. All right. Well, I'm waiting for my portrait. Let's talk about this amazing book. You're in a. You really are a, a great painter and portrait. Wow, he loves him. It's disgusting. I uh, I've gotten to know uh, a bunch from? of lawyers uh, since the presidency and uh, ride mountain bikes with them or play golf with them. And Can I, you imagine him riding a mountain bike? Yeah, portraits, totally. Because uh, I want to tell their stories. Uh, our veterans are a unique asset. You like sent them to the, to and, war. Uh, we need to not only honor them but to the extent they want help, help them transition from the military to civilian life. And uh, and this book uh, calls attention to what works and what doesn't work. For example, in dealing with post traumatic stress and traumatic. How about trauma. not sending them to war? In the I know. Go to the yeah. Bush Thank you. The Bush Center, yeah, in Dallas, Texas. What's the Bush Center? All for our vets program. We have. Uh, I remember I mocked him. We have some of the vets in the audience with us today. Thank you very much for your service. Thanks for everything. That's it. Doing for vets, raising money for vets. Thank you. 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 A little nervous when I showed Danny his painting because it's a little impressionistic. And he, you know, he politely said, God, that's great. <laughs> so when did you start painting? How long ago? Five years. Really? Now, yeah, Recently. I, I was agnostic on art and uh, got a little I was agnostic and, on uh, art. I read Winston Churchill's essay, Painting as a Pastime. I said, hell, I'm going to paint. He's, he was good. Yeah, he was good. He, he you was know really what? Good. Really good. And so, Remember uh, I said she's good with kids? And, set up. Kaori loved it, tweeting, well, that might help the undecideds. Uh, Honey Boo Boo, whose real name that is, is Alana awful. Thompson. That's not what happened, guys. Well, what happened? She said she was asked by Jimmy Kimmel. Jimmy Kimmel said to her, I can't believe they butchered this. Jimmy Kimmel said to her something like, um, Mitt Romney was asked who he liked more, Snooky or uh, Honey Boo Boo. And he said Snooky. So my question is, who are you endorsing for president? And she's like, who said that? And he's like, Mitt Romney. So who are you endorsing? She's like, Barack Obama. They cut Mar out the context. She said Barack Obama, but it was funny because she was doing it because Mitt Romney dissed said her. Snooki? Snooky. Snooky. Why why did he go for Snooky? I don't know. That's I mean weird. You'd go with the kid always. I know. That's really weird, right? That's weird. I don't think he knew what he was talking about, honestly. Yeah. Um Do you remember the Island like Turtles kid? The who? I like turtles, kid. No, who's that? Are you you've never seen this? Then look up I like turtles. Just if we're on a kid kick, this yeah, is my okay. One. Mitt Romney hearts Snooky. Anya, I and saw you passed out on a bed while Max was doing an interview. Talked him to be more camera aware. Really? What was that? What happened? <laughs> when was that? I don't know. Ask, what interview was it? I don't know. My, oh, Max. Yeah, seriously. 
Um, Someone said I look haggard. Who said that? Well, no, they just said life's not treating me well. I look haggard. Rude. I'll kick them out. Um, you've never seen that, Katie? What? Oh, the turtle? What is it? Yeah, look up. I like turtles. All right. Apparently, we can only watch some of it because the copyright stuff. Oh, my God. Look at her there. Look at her makeup. So sad. It's so sad and scary. What is it? I love turtles. I like turtles. You had to have seen this. It. Yeah. Back here live at the Waterfront Village with my friend, the zombie, Jonathan. You're looking good. Jonathan just got an awesome face paint job. What do you think? I like turtles. All right. You're great zombie. And good times here at the Waterfront Village. Open for the next 11 days. So We'll never know what he meant, but I, I really love that kid. Have you seen this? Yeah. Mom, it's so cute, right? I love little cute videos. Yes. Now I feel like, do I, it's I just because I'm be tired. What did you say? Up to be friends. I want everything to be low. Okay. Okay. Just try your best. I, I don't want you and my dad to be replaced in. And me again. That's so sad, honestly. I know. I feel like it's it's videos like these I feel bad about when the parents are like exploiting the kid. When the kid goes on news and says something. I know, yeah. But it's so look at her traumatized by the fact that the parents were yelling. Yeah, but lots of kids, to be fair, lots of kids have parents divorced or not divorced who yell at each other. And she is a very best in my heart. How did she? I want you, mom, my dad, everyone to be friends. I want everyone to be smiling, not like being mad. She's so cute. I want everything to smile, especially when I see someone. I want them to smile, especially Nana. Everyone. So cute. Everyone. To yeah, it's very cute. She wants their energy not high but low. Low, and I don't want my parents to be replaced and mean again. Replace? I, I, what does that mean? What is she I referring like to? Like we're taken over by somebody else, or something? Yeah, Jews. Maybe she means Jews. <laughs> Jews will not replace us. Just you never know. Just want to put that option out there. Yeah, you never, never know. Yeah. Uh, everyone's complaining about these streams stalling, but it's not just me, right? Apparently, everyone is having them, those issues. <sighs> I don't know. I haven't had any issues except with the commenters who said Well, I now someone said you look stunning tonight. Anya well, always looks stunning. To, tonight is no exception. You don't have to flatter me. I, d I didn't put makeup on, okay? Sorry, guys. I just. You have good, you have nice skin tone, though. Um. Oh, wait. We got another. What's this? Bush became a five-year-old child post-prez. What's that? Well, that's kind of like what you were saying. He just became like a child. Yeah. And that's why Ellen was interacting with him as though he's a child. Um, yeah. What's mother? Oh, motherhood? Oh, that's funny. Katie's time for motherhood. Yeah, no, I. <laughs> she was so cute, though. I, kids really entertain me. They are awesome. Yeah, they are awesome. They are. Yeah. Um, no, apparently it's system-wide issues with buffering. Apparently. Apparently, apparently, <laughs> apparently, I want everyone to be down here watching the show, not up here. Yeah, not up here. No mean. She's really I don't cute. I to be replaced. <laughs> That's really terrible and dark. Now I'm imagining like little like white supremacist girls, like right. and boys, like making it's like. Bad, I think she kind of thinks that like her parents get taken over by demons or something. I know. That's what I was thinking. That must be what she's. I don't want you guys to be replaced with the mean people again. She all, um, she does say uh, something about monsters, I believe. Oh wow! So she's she's like really that traumatized. My fr my friend's son, when he was younger, was like, um, I get scared at night that the monsters are from Wall Street are going to come out from under the bed. That kid was raised well. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he knows where the monsters are at. Exactly. Yeah. Where they at? No. Um, well, anything else? Thank you for joining. This is uh, it's always fun to watch. Send us clips and Anya and I will watch them and talk about them. You jerks. Yeah, you jerks. Bunch of jerks. Um, yeah. 
I think we learned a lot today. Yeah, it sounded like you had a great show. You taught us a lot about uh, Venezuela. I hope. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Next time we'll have you on uh, earlier and uh, in the show, we can have more of a structured chat. But this is fun. Cool, People yeah, like and videos. so I don't have to look so haggard. I know. Whatever. I you look very nice. And you got that like kind of prom. You always have the like pieces of ha it's like prom. I got style. my first haircut in like six or seven months because I was just fed up with it. I went and I got it. You know, my bangs and my fringe. Right. So you do have bangs. You consider yourself having bangs. Okay. Yeah. That's that's kind of the look that I like to go for. Yeah. It's just easier because then all this gets put away and I just right. have to worry about these. Right. Little... Pay us. Your pay us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Got to get it more. Well, that's the prom thing I'm talking about. Like, in, yeah. you know, those things where they have their hair up and then they have the prom hair. Prom, Hasid. Same thing. Fine line. Um. Uh, all right. Well, yeah. Come back on. Yeah, and uh, hopefully we can. Maybe we can do a Rania and Anya show. Yeah, let's do it. Oh, well, what we said last time is I, I released this clip, but we want to play Hammered and Sickled, which is where we find we take shots. Like we, I don't know the exact mechanics of it, but we take shots, we drink, and it's based on um, uh. It's based on Chuck Todd saying that Sanders was going to get hammered and sickled. Oh, yeah. That's funny. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. Poor Chuck. He's, like, been reduced in his airtime, I think, on MSNBC. Oh, great. Why? I wonder why. They're, putting, they're streaming him more online, and then they're doing more Nicole Wallace, which I don't understand why. She's, like, a Bush administration official. Well, you saw the terrible interview he did with um, Karen Bass, right? Where he he asked her about her Cuba comments. Yeah, he's such a piece of he's jerk. such a piece of jerk. Yeah, hate him, Chuck hate Toddler. Him. That's what Max and I call him. Chuck what? Chuck Toddler. Yeah, he he's yeah. I didn't know that that Trump called him like Sleepy Eyes or something. I didn't know that was an anti-Semitic. I mean, is but it? I Max also I didn't know Chuck Todd was Jewish. Yeah, I didn't know that until yeah. You know what makes him calling Bernie's quoting someone that that called Sanders supporters digital brown shirts not okay. You don't have Jewish license the way oh, I do. Since I'm offensive he in general, Jewish, yeah. he is Jewish. I know that's what I'm saying. I'm yeah. saying like don't play, don't don't try to use your Jewish license too much. Yeah, to be like to compare Bernie. Bernie, to yeah, he's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, he's awful. Um. Oh my god. Do you see the 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 Chuck Todd? That's a good one too. Someone someone. I thought you said Chuck Tawdry when you said um Chuck uh, Toddler. Nah, uh, toddler. You saw that um J Joe Kennedy um is like trying to protect. Do you see he didn't get endorsed by the Boston Globe and he was like it's because it represents the wealthy white. Oh right, it represents you. Yeah, I know. I hate him. Me too. I know. And then he's like calls all these people Bernie people for attacking him. There was like That's literally so all they good. talked about all, all they talked about was his policies. Someone said they call him Tuck Chode. That's good. Tuck Chode. How come I don't see it? I think because it's a, a delay where I'm when I Tuck it's it's faster on YouTube, but you guys have some good names. Yeah. For the toddler. Oh, God. If it is Sunday, it's piss on the press with fuckwad. Hmm. Um all right. Well, um, thank you again, everyone, for coming by. Um, yeah, thanks. Future guests to look forward to are uh, include Thomas Frank. Very cool. Well, uh, I can't think of anyone off the top of my head. I can't remember who's coming on Sunday, but it's not Thomas Frank. Because Thomas Frank and I, Matt Taibbi and I talked to Thomas Frank already. So for this week. <laughs> so we don't want to, you know, we want to stagger it. Um, and Yes. See you soon. Oh, like, subscribe, do all that stuff. Like, subscribe, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. Thanks, and, Katie. Uh, thanks, Anya. I hope I'll see you one day soon when all this I is know. over. I know. It's just so terrible. I know. Peace. Stay safe. Bye. bye. Tell Max I say bye. Hi. We will. Bye. Okay, everyone. Thank you for joining. Thanks for joining. Good night. <laughs>